Thanks. Uh, good morning uh, and welcome to the second meeting of the committee in 2015. Uh, everyone present is asked to switch off mobile phones uh, and other electronic equipment as they affect the broadcasting system. Uh, some committee members may consult tablets. Uh, that's because we provide meeting papers in digital format. Uh, we have apologies today from Claire Adamson, uh, who cannot attend this morning's meeting. Uh, I therefore welcome uh, Stuart Stevenson, MSP, uh, to uh, the meeting. Uh, thanks for attending this morning, Stuart. Uh, agenda item one uh, is declarations of interest. Uh, firstly, I'd like to thank Anne McTaggart uh, for her, her contributions to the committee uh, and wish her well with her new committee appointment. Um, colleagues who have served in the committee for a while with Anne uh, will recognise uh, her value, particularly uh, when it came uh, to going around the country and meeting uh, the public. Uh, Anne had the ability to get folk to open up and, uh, and tell us things which uh, sometimes it was very difficult uh, to, to get folks to do. So uh, all, all the best to Anne and thanks for her efforts. And I'd now like to welcome uh, Cara Hilton to the committee. And can I invite you, Cara, to declare any relevant interests that you may have? Yeah, um, thank you. I just refer to my register of members' interests. Thank you very much. Uh, Stuart Stevenson. Um, it, just if it's convenient to uh, convene at this point, it might be useful uh, to declare that I do have a member of my family who's a freelance uh, stage manager in the theatre industry. I don't believe it will touch on the matter that we will come to on item four, but I would just like to put it in the record in case it does. Thank you, uh, Mr Stevenson. Better to be safe than sorry. Uh, item two is the appointment of a European reporter. Um, I, I asked for uh, invitations uh, of interest from members, um, uh, and I would suggest that uh, we ask John Wilson to take on the role as EU reporter for the Local Government and Regeneration Committee. Can we agree? Thank you very much. Uh, agenda item three is public petitions, uh, and that's petition PE1538 uh, by Dr Burton of, on behalf of Accountabil Accountability Scotland. Uh, the petition asks us to urge the Scottish Government to amend the Scottish Public Services Ombudsman Act 2002 to ensure complainants are shown all correspondence between the SPSO uh, and the bodies complained about before the investigation uh, is included, including emails in that, and they are also made aware of the content of any verbal communication. We took evidence last week from the SPSO during which this issue was discussed, uh, and we have had the benefit of a written response from the SPSO uh, and the petitioner's comments thereon. Uh, finally, we also have received the internal guidance used by SPSO staff relating to information sharing. Do members have any views on the petition? No. In which case, can I suggest um, that we uh, close uh, the petition? Thank you very much. Um, uh, although the, the matter is not covered by this petition, uh, I'm aware of the discussion in the Petitions Committee around a review of the operation of the SPSO. It is uh, my opinion that such a review would be premature, coming relatively soon after the Parent Act was received in 2009 uh, by a committee of this Parliament. That review led to a number of changes being made to the legislation, including uh, to Section 19, which is the subject of this petition. Part of the 2009 review, which looked at all the bodies supported by the SPCB, was to consider their operations and whether they were needed or could be amalgamated. Given the outcome of that review, uh, consideration of a further review uh, now would be premature. Do other, any other members uh, have any views on that petition, uh, position? No? Thank you very much. In which case we move to agenda item four, which is the Air, Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill. Uh, and today um, is our fifth oral evidence session uh, on that bill, and we have a round table session uh, followed by a, a panel. Uh, can I go round the table and ask our witnesses to uh, introduce themselves? And can I start with you, please, Janet? Thank you very much. My name is Janet Hood of Janet Hood Consulting. I offer specialist uh, licensing services to the trade. I'm here representing the Association of Licensed Adult Entertainment Venues of Scotland. We thank the committee for the opportunity to present evidence at the committee. Do you just want a brief introduction or do you want to... That's fine for thank just you. now and we'll come back to you and other stuff if you thank don't you. mind. Uh, Cameron Buchanan. 
MSP for the Lothians and member of the Local Government Committee. Hey, Andrew Cox, and I'm one of the managers in Glasgow 7th Heaven Lap Dancing Club. John Wilson, Deputy Convener of the Committee and Central Scotland MSP. I'm Professor Phil Hubbard from the University of Kent. I'm leading academic authority on the licensing of lap dancing and sexual entertainment venues in England and Wales. I'm Alec Rowley, MSP for the Cowan Beath Constituency. Good morning, I'm Mary Miller. I'm a legal manager for licensing at Glasgow City Council and clerk to the Glasgow Licensing Board. Oh, thank you very much, Convener. It's Sandra White, MSP, Glasgow Kelvin, who has obviously a declaration of interest in regards to part of the bill. And I thank you very much for allowing me to, to be here today. Tara Hilton, MSP for Dunfermline. Uh, John Morgan, Director of the Federation of Scottish Theatre, a membership body uh, for dance and theatre companies and venues, around 160 members across Scotland. Stuart Stevenson, Member of the Scottish Parliament for Bamshire and Buchan Coast. Good morning. Eric Anderson, I'm Deputy Clerk to Aberdeen City Licensing Board and also Legal Advisor to the Licensing Committee, the committee that deals with civic government legislation. Hello, I'm Willie Coffey, MSP, Kilmarnock in Irvine Valley. I'm Laura Thompson from Zero Tolerance, which is a charity working to end violence against women. Thank you. Uh, and I'm Kevin Stewart, uh, convener of the committee. Uh, we also have uh, received apologies this morning from Willie Taylor of Dumfries and Galloway Council, uh, as he is unable to attend because of bad weather conditions uh, in the area. Um, can I say to um, uh, uh, panellists that you are most welcome, uh, when you're called to speak, you don't need to press the button uh, uh, on your console to put the microphone on. Uh, that will be done for you. So um, uh, just uh, if, if I call you, just hands off the consoles. would be glad. Um, my first uh, question um, is around about uh, sexual entertainment premises. And obviously, uh, we have a, a situation uh, whereby uh, many of us who represent areas where there are such venues, there are often complaints from folks who live close by. Um, uh, they do cause a little bit of uh, controversy. Um, can I ask uh, folks their feelings uh, on that situation and uh, in terms of, uh, of the positioning? Uh, of some of these prem premises. Janet, do you, would you like to go first, please? Yes, I would. The Scottish Parliament very cleverly regulated in the uh, adult entertainment venues, which are what exists at the moment, under the Licensing Scotland Act 2005. One of the great boons within that Act to anybody who has difficulty with any type of licensed premises is that any person can raise a complaint, any person can raise a review. So if there are complaints about the running of these premises, they would easily be able to be brought to licensing boards who I have no doubt would deal with them. The Act is predicated upon five objectives, which includes the protection um, of people, the preservation of public safety, the prevention of crime and disorder, and the protection of health. It is highly surprising that comments are made that these complaints are out there, given that as far as I am aware, and of course I'm not omniscient, there have been no complaints on these grounds to do with the running of premises. One could say, oh well, people might feel intimidated to coming to a licensing board, but the Scottish Parliament thought about that. There are licensing standards officers, there are obviously the police to whom complaints can be made, and I have it in my experience had complainers on other matters such as noise nuisance from a noisy pub when the licensing standards officer took the complaint to the licensing board, as is his right, um, uh, on behalf of the people who were making the complaint because they did not have the confidence to do so. So it is therefore surprising that as far as I'm aware, none of this has been raised with licensing boards to date. Thank you very much. Um, feel free to indicate if you want to come in. Uh, Professor Hubbard, would you uh, like to make a comment on, on that question? Uh, yeah, I mean, the academic evidence suggests that there's no particular association between criminality and the presence of lap dance clubs or gentlemen's clubs in particular communities, but I think we need to acknowledge that they do create anxiety and moral disapproval from certain sections of society, and there's a great deal of evidence that people are anxious about them being located close to residential premises, close to places of worship, 
close to schools and other community facilities. Um, the introduction of the Policing and Crime Act in 2009 in England and Wales gave adoptive legislation to local authorities allowing them to control this. It's allowed them to do that with a degree of flexibility and discretion, and in many cases successfully. However, I think the introduction of the Act in the UK was by and large uh, farcical in terms of the way it was allowed to proceed. What we have at the moment in the UK, sorry, in England and Wales, in England and Wales at the moment we have a situation which I'd like to see avoided in Scotland, and I think you could learn from the lessons of England and Wales. And that is that the uh, legislation is adoptive, it's not mandatory, and what we have in England and Wales at the moment is a situation where uh, there is a licensing regime for these establishments in one local authority, yet not a neighbouring one, for example, in London, where the fees for these establishments range from £300 to £26,000. We have a situation where some local authorities will ban nudity, others will not. And the whole situation has given rise to a whole range of appeal cases and litigation in which legal unreasonableness and inconsistency have been raised as valid concerns. Some of those appeals have been upheld. It's created a great deal of anxiety, uh, expense, expenditure and time for many local authorities who've been left to evolve policies of their own. My recommendation is that if Scotland introduces uh, this bill, which I think they should do, they should ensure that licensing for these types of premises is mandatory to all local authorities in Scotland, that the legislation provides a much clearer definition of sexual entertainment, because that's being challenged in England and Wales at the moment. It needs to distinguish this form of entertainment from theatre performance. It also needs to ensure that the legislation as currently framed does not allow for massage parlour owners to effectively licence their uh, premises as brothels, which, as we know, would be contrary to other criminal law. And finally, we need to make sure that there are clearer grounds for refusal present in the primary legislation here and not just in guidance notes. I think it needs to be stated in this legislation that local authorities should pay particular attention to the uses in the vicinity where those uses include education, places of worship, community facilities and so on. I think that should be stipulated in the legislation uh, so that if this goes to appeal, the primary legislation indicates these grounds for refusal more clearly. Sandra White, please. Thank you very much, Convener. If I can just touch on what Janet had already mentioned about um, no one having objected. I, I appeared at John Street uh, Licensing Board uh, in regards to clubs which were opening in Royal Exchange Square, uh, along with a number of business people who had businesses there as well. So it's untrue to say that uh, people haven't objected and haven't went along. And it is quite intimidating when you go to these places because you have the owners of the clubs and others there as well. And you have to appear before the panel of councillors and give you know, evidence, etc. So it's, it's quite like a mini court. So it is quite intimidating when you go, and I certainly have, along with others, been there. So I just wanted to make that point. If I could pick up on the point which Mr Hubbard, or Professor Hubbard, had mentioned as well, um, I agree with most of what Mr Hubbard has said. We were advised when I was pushing forward this bill that to make it mandatory would be much more difficult. And obviously the legislation in England and Wales went through before we managed to put this and hopefully put this legislation through. Sarah, you when, when you're talking about put forward the bill, you're talking about your members' bill rather yes. than the bill. So, uh, yeah, the draft bill the members' bill with. was intentional at the time to be mandatory, but we were advised by legal services, etc. It would be much better to make it uh, basically local authorities. There's some local authorities, obviously, Glasgow City Council, uh, cost them a lot of money when they went forward to the Court of Appeal session. And invariably, they, they dropped their case as the owners appealed. So it was felt at the time that the choice from each individual local authority would be the best way to go forward, because then the people, the public who live in that area, if the legislation was there, they could ask their councils to enact it. So I'll leave it there at the moment, Karina, but I thank you very much for allowing me to come in at that point, and if I could come back in some of the other points. OK. Can I take in uh, Mary Miller, first of all, please? And then I'll come to Cameron Buchanan, uh, Janet Hood and then Stuart Stevenson. OK, thank you very much, Convener. I suppose I'd like to um, agree with some of the comments actually made by Janet in terms of that I, in Glasgow we do have four uh, lap dancing clubs or licensed premises with adult entertainment. 
and there haven't been any um, reviews brought by members of the public against those premises, but equally there's been no reviews brought against any licensed premises under the new provisions by any member of the public. And I think that probably says a lot about people's understanding and involvement in the licensing process. We did, of course, have um, an objection to a lap dancing club at the time of the transitional arrangements um, brought by one of the licensing standards officers, and that, of course, led to the, the appeal in the, the now famous Bright Crew case. And I think one of the issues that we have is now that uh, because of the decision in Bright Crew, and it became clear that the licensing board's responsibility is primarily in terms of the sale of alcohol, in terms of those licensing objectives, licensing standards officers now do not regulate the adult entertainment activity because of that decision. So the premises are largely unregulated. I'd also like to support the comments made by Sandra White. When we have had new applications, and it is going back some time, there has been significant level of objection to those applications. So I think, again, that supports the comments made by the professor about the feelings of local communities about new establishments opening up in their area and the impact that could have in a residential area. Janet Hood, please. My understanding is there have been no um, new applications for some time, certainly in Glasgow, and that we're on a falling market. There were uh, 20 uh, lap dancing clubs in Scotland. We're now down to 17. Uh, one of those 17 happens to be... Um, uh, two premises owned by the same person in the same building, so I suppose we could say it's 16. Aberdeen City Council certainly turned me down for an application for a lap dancing club in Chapel Street on the grounds of the protection of children from harm. They have turned down one, um, to my understanding, I didn't act for the client at the time, um, in Union Street on the grounds of location, and they have turned down another on the grounds of the unsuitability of the location. The Licensing Scotland Act covers, as indeed does the Civic Government Scotland um, Act 2000 and, uh, sorry, uh, 1982, uh, sets down criteria. Uh, the criteria are that, uh, one of the cr criterions are that local government is in fact a statutory objector or a statutory consultee. Local government already has an ability to comment or complain. Whether or not local government has commented or complained on any licensing application, I have no idea. They certainly haven't done so in any of the clients with whom I have been dealing. What I would say is, though, and taking up Professor Hubbard's point, location, character and condition already form part of the Licensing Scotland Act 2005. You look at where the, the licensing boards look at where the club is, if it was near a school or near a church or near something of that um, ilk, then it is highly unlikely that an adult entertainment licence or a premises with that um, activity taking place therein would be granted for that activity. Um, if the character of the building was such that it was overtly demonstrating what was going on within it, this is barred throughout the bulk of Scotland, then the, not only the planning committee who deal with advertisements, but also the licensing board would be commenting on the unsuitability of that. That could be linked directly to the sale of alcohol because these adverts lead people in, whether it's a tenant sign or any other sign that might be on the premises. I think it is unfortunate that it is being implied that local government has absolutely no say in this. Local government has a say in this and have so far appears, anyway, to have chosen not to have their say. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan. Thank you. Thank you. Good morning, Pat. I just had a comment from, a clarification from Professor Hubbard. In England and Wales, are theatre licensing, is it the same as sexual entertainment or not? You said it was, that it was rather loosely worded. Could you just clarify that point? Is it the same licensing? My expertise is in the area of sexual entertainment yeah. venue licensing. It's a separate licensing regime to public entertainment. As far as I know, there's been no theatrical performance or theatre that's applied for an SCV licence. There are currently 221 venues in England and Wales licensed for sexual entertainment. Uh, the majority of those are gentlemen's clubs. There are five gay clubs where there are what you call dark rooms or fumble rooms where gay men frequent in sex with one another. There's one swingers club that's also licensed. There are no spaces of theatre, theatrical entertainment or burlesque, as far as I know it, licensed in this way. 
Okay. okay, thank you. Cameron. That's fine. Thank uh, you. John Morgan, I think you wanted to come in at that point. Just a clarification about the licensing of theatres in England and Wales. Uh, they come in within a thing called a premises licence, which is a catch-all licence covering alcohol, uh, public entertainment, theatre and cinema. So there's a single licence for those premises in England and Wales. Thank you. Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you very much, Convener. Um, clearly, this early part of the discussion was focused on uh, if such premises are, and activities are taking place in communities, they need to be appropriately lo located away from sensitive areas such as schools and churches and so on and so forth. And that draws me immediately to uh, what's in the bill by way of an exemption, whereby uh, it's possible for premises to host uh, sexual entertainment on no more than four occasions in a 12-month period. In other words, they're outside the regime altogether. And I just wondered if I could draw on the expertise of the people uh, who are with us uh, this morning uh, as to whether that might create disproportionate discomfort communities because there's no control over the location. There would, in law, be nothing to stop. Uh, premises immediately next to a school being used on an infrequent basis, but causing disproportionate concern uh, to, uh, to, 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 to uh, uh, people who, who, whose, uh, whose kids go to that school, etc. Uh, and in fact, calling the whole, whole attempt to uh, bring some sanity to this through this legislation into disrepute. And I just wonder if there's anything that the experts uh, around the table can contribute to that, because I'm personally coming to this quite uncomfortable uh, about this a, 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 a exemption, and in particular on the matter of location. I'm going to take Eric Anderson in, because Aberdeen City Council was mentioned, and you can cover the, the points that Mr Stevenson has just made as well. Please, Eric. Yes, certainly. This was uh, one of the concerns that uh, we had uh, set out in our response um, to the consultation, and we consider that this would have uh, potentially create a loophole. Um, which could be exploited by organisers who, rather than having a permanent premises with a licence and proper facilities for performers, could simply transfer the activity around different venues where there are no such facilities and protection. And such a, in our view, such an exemption could therefore mean defeating the aims and purposes of the amendments to the 82 Act. Okay. And, and Ms Hood made some comments about Aberdeen City. Um, do you want to... To react to those? So far as the um, refusal of licences is concerned, I can certainly confirm that since the um, 2005 Act has been put in place, we have refused one premises and uh, we have refused others in the past under the previous legislation. That is correct. Thank you. Uh, Laura Townsend, please. I think what's been missing in this conversation so far is is how, what, what, what's different about sexual entertainment or adult entertainment and how this fits in with other policies across the Scottish Government. The Zero Tolerance position, along with the position of many other equalities organisations in Scotland and the Scottish Government's own Violence Against Women strategy, is that sexual entertainment is a form of commercial sexual exploitation with links to violence against women. Um, and I feel that it's the importance of bringing in this separate licensing structure is not just because we've had issues with, you know, around alcohol licensing and licensing it under alcohol. It's because there are so many issues around prostitution being accessed through lap dancing. Research within Scotland shows that that's very prevalent. All the issues around uh, prostitution, um, women involved in prostitution are much more likely to be victims of violence against women, women feeling unsafe around the venues, women working in the venues, facing abuse and harassment. And if we're going to bring in a new licensing regime, which we support with the caveat that we would like to see an end to this kind of exploitation, then it needs to take these broader themes in mind. And that's why I agree with uh, Professor Hubbard that it should be mandatory for all local authorities in Scotland to take this up. Otherwise, we're, we're essentially ignoring a lot of these very important issues. Again, issues around child protection. It shouldn't be uh, up to local authorities to decide that these aren't relevant issues to them. And again, with um, the ki kinds of regulations that come in, they should be, there should be guidance for local authorities on what they should be looking at, what they should be inspecting, and what they should be expecting licensed venues to do in terms of, say, allowing welfare visitors in to speak to their workers, in terms of contact or lack of contact between customers and workers, that's all very important. And to come back to the point around um, the number of times um, 
sexual entertainment happens in a venue. I think when you take those themes into account, it's irrelevant how many times it happens. The potential for harm is there no matter how many times it happens. And uh, I think a lot of people in the submissions to the consultation expressed worries that organisers would simply move from venue to venue. And I think that makes it much more difficult to regulate those kinds of harms. So I would agree that there shouldn't be... It should be a limit of, you know, if it's, if it's once a year, then you should have to have a licence for that. In terms of uh, the signage around schools, I would just like to point out that if you walk down a Lothian Road or what's called the pubic triangle by locals in Edinburgh, you will see it very, very clear that very sexualised, very obvious signage is being used. It's, it's been challenged by zero tolerance. Nothing has changed. It's within one or two streets of at least three schools. So something is obviously not happening right there. Uh, before I bring in uh, Janet Hood, who's indi indicated that she wants to come in on this point, um, one of the things which the committee has looked at uh, in previous sessions is round about occasional alcohol license licensing. And what we have here is, uh, in terms of this uh, four times a year, seems to be that kind of uh, occasionality again. Do, do these kind of situations cause real difficulties for, for licensing boards? Ms Miller, do you want to, to go first there? I think it would, just, it would be almost impossible to enforce the number of times that the activity is held. Licensing boards or licensing standards officers simply wouldn't know how many times it has happened because there would be no requirement for them to know. You would be relying on the, the, the premises to, to self-regulate and admit to keep it to the fore because... You simply couldn't rely on licensed standards officers being able to cover all licensed premises to, to keep track of the number of times that activity takes place. So I would have shared the concerns about it being unregulated generally, but I also feel that it would be impossible to enforce, to, to limit to, uh, to that number. Uh, Eric Anderson, please. Yeah, I concur with everything that Mary Miller said there. The um, control would be very difficult in, mon in monitoring um, if it was not properly licensed. OK, thank you. Professor Hubbard, you... I just think that these type of um, restrictions have been brought in to deal with the situation one finds in some holiday resorts in England and Wales, Newquay, Scarborough, but particularly things that happen around, say, for example, the Cheltenham Gold Cup, where for seven days premises were put on lap dancing during the duration of the Gold Cup and the rest of the year wouldn't have it, and that falls within the kind of 12 times a year limit they've set in England and Wales. I think it will be local authorities will become very aware of the fact that a particular premise was abusing and, and passing that law for the whole week or so a particular sporting event or during, say, the Edinburgh Festival, a particular uh, pub or club was putting on this type of entertainment, I think that it will become clear to the licensing board through reports. Um, I, I, I'm looking at uh, the, the licensing clerks to, to see if they would agree with that position. I, I, I would imagine in certain cases, as we've heard uh, in terms of uh, some of the private members' clubs that exist out there, that that may be a little bit more difficult for, for you guys to actually get to grips with what's going on. Would that be the case? I mean, uh, in terms Miller? of the example, given a sort of pop-up one-off annual event, yes, I, I suppose there, there would be more visibility on that. What I was thinking of is the... the um, the idea about this entertainment being taken around different premises, I think the, the, the board or the licensed standards officer, it would be very difficult for them to keep track of that within existing um, premises or, or licensed premises. There are a number of private members clubs and sports and social clubs in Aberdeen. Uh, Mr Anderson, would, they, would you be able to keep track if, if there well, was well, that? Well, there, 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 are, there are indeed, but again, it's difficult to keep uh, track of every activity, all the activities, and certainly where there was uh, the opportunity of an itinerant um, type of entertainment where they're moving from place to place, here one day, gone the next day. It uh, just makes the monitoring and the control very difficult to keep tabs on, and um, certainly I would uh, consider opposing that proposal. And I, I agree that perhaps, on a, as the professor was saying, on a one-off major event where there were consistent types of regular entertainment on a, an annual basis, that's one scenario. But overall, um, taking it from a, on a day to, what could be a day-to-day, week-by-week basis, that's a different story altogether. Janet, please. 
Thank you. Um, I find myself and my clients find themselves in agreement with um, the licensing boards and with zero tolerance on this particular point. At the moment, the clubs that I represent in the Association of Adult Entertainment Venues are highly regulated. They have vast numbers of stewards, CCTV, high levels of training for management, and the premises are properly and well regulated, and they are places where the dancers, who are not employees, they are not forced to dance, they, they apply to dance within the premises, come to dance. We have particular concerns about either the four um, events a year, because we feel that these could take place in unregulated public places. That's bad enough. But what is actually happening just now, and what we feel the Scottish Government should be turning its eye on, is the fact that there is seriously unregulated sexual entertainment going on within Scotland. I spent an exceedingly unpleasant weekend last weekend typing in, among other things in Google, strippers Dundee or strippers Perth or even strippers Edsel, where I live, and discovered to my horror that I, and I am unlikely to do this, but if I were a group of young men or whatever I might do this, could engage a woman to come to my premises for the purposes of performing a strip tease. I could say this is for a stag night, or I could say it is for something else. They would come to your private house, they could come to your hotel room. They're not going to turn up in tassels and a g-string, they're going to turn up looking as if they are normal human beings. They get into a room, they're completely unregulated. I asked if I would have to pay on each one of these sites, I said, do I have to pay for a chaperone? No chaperones. These are the people who are being seriously exploited within Scotland, and this is something that my clients have serious concerns with. In comments at a previous meeting of this committee, there was an implication that striptease, etc., for hen nights, stag nights, stuff like this, was actually something that was not really particularly serious. I would say that this is where the serious harm is likely to lie within Scotland. And if you have the four days, then these events could be happening probably in pubs and clubs. At least they will be in public, and there is a chance that the girls might get away unscathed. But the one thing Thing I can say is they won't be regulated the way the adult entertainment venues are currently regulated. My clients have a toolkit which has been presented to this committee, Immigration and Migrant Toolkit, in which girls are identified with passport, with driver's licence, their next of kin is sourced. These, these photographs are taken of their ID documents, these are passed to the police. This all helps keep people safe, not only within the clubs. Payments are only made to the girls' bank accounts or into their hands. No payments are made to third parties. This is not the case when one goes online to book a girl to come to your flat or bedroom. And these are matters which I think this committee should have concern. Thank you. Andrew Cox, please. Hi. Uh, yes. Um, I'd just like to say that working in these clubs, you know, um, the one I work in, no one's ever been arrested or charged with people trafficking, prostitution, money laundering, or any of these other things that have been, you know, kind of targeted towards us. And um, I believe it was Laura said something about, you know, letting welfare in. We, we're open to anybody, you know. We let the police in, LSOs, anybody. I mean, anybody here is welcome to come in. You can come in and talk to the girls. Um, and, you know, my main concern, other than the girls, is myself. If um, there's a, a ban or you know, the zero number of licences for Glasgow, I'll get put out of a job. And I'd like to know what's going to happen to me as a provision to, to help retrain me. You know, there's, there's nine or ten people, full-time employees in my club, and that's just one club. So you could be talking a thousand jobs quite easily, including the dancers. So, I mean, will I get a redundancy pay? Because once the club loses its licence, you know, the, the money will dry up. So who, who helps me pay my mortgage, plan for my future? You know, um, I just want to know if that's going to be mentioned. OK, thank you. Um, Stuart Stevenson, please. Uh, thank you. I, I just want to follow up on uh, Professor Hubbard's uh, description of the 12 occasions provision in the English uh, legislation. As a substitute member of the committee, I'm afraid I may not be quite up to speed with some of my colleagues. Um, and I just wanted to explore with the professor and with others who can make informed comment what the practical effect is. The example that uh, was given was Cheltenham Gold Cup. Fair enough. Um, but 
does the way that 12 exemptions work inform the committee? I mean, I started from the point of view that the four that's in the bill that's before us could, by taking those entirely outside the licensing system, if in particular there's no drinks license associated with it, and after all, bring your own bottle is common in certain circumstances otherwise, and it could be the case here. Um, whether that in England causes difficulties for communities, you know, practical examples would be, I think, helpful in informing our understanding of what we should do in Scotland. Uh, I, think, I think this issue is actually quite a, a red herring, actually, in relation to what we're talking about, because we are talking about the licensing <coughs> of a premise, not the licensing of an activity. If an activity is highly itinerant, it's not likely that any community identifies a particular premise as being associated with that activity. And therefore, I can't think of any particular uh, situation where itinerant striptease at a venue has caused anxiety for communities. It's where a particular... Uh, premise becomes identified, visibly known and advertised as a lap dancing club, the opposition anxiety begins to be perpetuated. Can I, can I just intervene just yeah. to, to, be, to be clear? Um, the itinerant activity is presumably by some means advertised, otherwise it would be difficult for clients to arrive at the venue that is itinerant by nature. It, 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 how does it actually work in practice? Forgive my naivety. No. I just... there, there are agencies in England and Wales that will provide dancers to certain striptease pubs. Those striptease pubs, you can't find websites for them. They do it as an irregular activity and they will generally advertise through word of mouth or just putting something on the chalkboard outside. You know, it may be a Sunday lunchtime once every six months. It may be a regular Friday or Saturday nights. And these places are not particularly known or reputed for sexual entertainment. They wouldn't be understood by most residents as specifically having that type of entertainment. And it will, will alternate with all forms of other entertainment, such as live music and comedy. So I do think this is a little bit of a red herring. If you have particular anxieties about itinerant adult entertainment, then you should license the dancers and the performers, not the premise. Just finally, uh, convener, so what you're saying to the committee is that the premises that are operating on the exemption basis are all premises that are otherwise regulated, that, the, that you're, you're, you're suggesting to me, or at least I'm hearing, um, that the, 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 there are not cases of premises not regulated by some regulatory regime that are exploiting the exemption. Is that what I'm being told? It, it's possible that some escape regulation, but the majority will license for a standard premise license for alcohol. OK. Sandra White, please. Thank you very much, Kevin. There was a number of issues that I, I did want to raise. And uh, when we're talking about uh, local authorities, absolutely, they you know, have a, a, a very uh, hard job to do. I would like to know how many times in Aberdeen City Council uh, that uh, clubs have actually appealed their decision. That, that would be interesting to know. And in the area where I represent in Glasgow, we have uh, two lap dancing clubs at either end of the, of the city where a street away there is a church, the Gallic Church and uh, the church at Nelson Mandela Place. So therefore, there are churches there, but that hasn't stopped the clubs from appealing the decision and winning the decision and costing the, you know, obviously the council, council taxpayers money. And I'm very pleased that uh, Andrew says he welcome anyone into his club, because certainly I've been in the club. I, I did do my homework before I ventured on this, this, this bill. And the one thing that struck me in the club... Struck me again, Sandra, because I, you said this bill again. Yeah, um, I'm sorry. Your, you, yeah. your previous bill, not this draft bill yes. that we're discussing. Yeah. Yeah. I suppose it's uh, all experience to take you forward, and, and I'm very pleased <laughs> that the committee is scrutinising the bill in this respect. Um, what struck me in some of the clubs I went in was the lack of customers. So I often wondered how where the money, how they made the money to continue on in that respect. But I think we're, we're missing a great point here, and I come back to Laura Thompson's issue here, is how women uh, are looked upon uh, by the men who frequent the, pub, the, the clubs. And a number of clubs that I was in, and one in particular where I spoke to a group of young men, I felt they were exploited because they were being egged on by their friends to put money, blah, 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 to get a dance. And when I asked these young men what they thought, I couldn't repeat the language that they mentioned regarding what they thought of these women. And when I asked if it was their wives, girlfriends, sister, 
they would never do that, they said. So that's, that's another point I think we really have to, to look at in that respect. And when we talk about employment, these dancers are self-employed. They pay to dance, they pay for their costumes, they pay for the tables. So I think these girls are being exploited in very many ways. And it's a perception that men in particular have of the, the women when they, they see these uh, dancers or whatever you wish to call them. I mean, we talk about absolutely the, the pubic corner in, in uh, Edinburgh, very well advertised, people are walking about. There was a lady who works in one of these clubs, was accosted outside these clubs when she wasn't working by a customer. And I think that, to me, says a lot of how men perceive uh, the actions. And that poor lady was accosted outside the club. And in my area, we have people who have to walk past these clubs from Central Station, people coming, going from work, going about their regular business. And I think we do, do need to look at it seriously. Um, Eric Anderson, there were specifics about Aberdeen and the, the Sandra's line. There. Yes, certainly. In, in respect of um, Aberdeen, I think I did mention that since the 2005 Act, we actually have uh, refused just the one um, application for a sex entertainment premises, and that was not appealed by the applicant. But, of course, we can't read anything into, into that, that particular uh, uh, scenario. Um, but, um, and as far as the other two were concerned, that's, as I say, previous legislation really gone back into the midst of time. I could say that the, the case in question, if I recall, did attract about um, objections into, into double figures. I can't remember, the, I think it's... Uh, Rather, thank you. Sorry, yes, you were in service. Um, it just it was mine. <laughs> I, I, I wasn't at that particular, uh, didn't clerk that particular meeting. But, um, so there, there is a particular concern, um, as you could perhaps um, detect from that. Okay, Mary Miller, please. Just to follow up on the point regarding the sort of occasional use of premises, it could be that the, the temporary licence provisions would suit here that someone have our premises being used on an occasional basis, they could apply for a temporary licence in the same way that um, a one-off public entertainment event would, can be covered by a, a, a temporary licence. Either I'm not, I'm not sure... Uh, whether the provisions currently extend to include the temporary licence provisions, I would need to check that, but certainly that would be an option rather than having the, the de minimis provision. Just on um, a more general point and following on from some of the comments from um, Sandra White, it strikes me that in, li in licensing legislation we have uh, regulations in licensing that covers a uh, window cleaning activity, we licence and regulate somebody selling burgers from a van, we, we licence and regulate somebody selling chewing gum at three o'clock in the morning under late hours catering. But at the moment, in terms of current legislation, th this form of activity is not regulated. There are no provisions, there is no control over the conduct of this activity. And I think that's quite a fundamental point um, about th th what this bill would allow uh, local authorities to be able to do that isn't currently available to them or to licensing boards. You. Janet Hood, please. I would like to come in on um, Laura's point on advertising um, of clubs in the Lothian Road area to start with, please. Advertising is something which is in the control of local government planning committees. If the advertising was deemed by the local government, who are, uh, according to um, Mary, might be anxious to control these venues, one would have thought that the advertising which causes offence, and Sandra has mentioned this and Laura has mentioned this, should be controlled by the planning authority. And that is something I think that should be taken up with planning authorities on that matter. Mary suggests that Bright Crew has removed all element of control. The five objectives and the requirement to consider um, any form of criminality uh, through um, fitness and proper, which is coming back in, give licensing boards huge control. My client's premises are among the most controlled premises in Scotland. This is why we have so few incidents of any harm happening. The controls are implemented by management, staff and stewarding. All of the activities in the clubs are open to scrutiny by police, licensing standards officers and, as has been issued, um, indicated by Andrew, any other 
person from local government who wishes to come in or from anywhere else who wishes to come in is always welcome because my clients are not trying to hide anything they do. They welcome scrutiny because they wish to be in a position to demonstrate how well the clubs are regulated. Part of the issue in the Bright Crew was whether a kettle should be produced in a changing room. There were issues which really have nothing to do with the actual preservation of order and good practice within premises. I would defy anybody around this table to suggest that good practice, care for the dancers, care for the public, care for the staff, care for people in the vicinity are not currently carried out by the clients that I represent. Andrew Cox, please. Thank you, Sandra, was saying. Um, obviously, earlier you were saying it was quite daunting going to the licensing board. You should um, try doing this for me. Um, you mentioned that um, the premises were near a church. Um, just as a kind of layman, usually you know, I'd assume churches are more kind of bonding things. So I don't think the two crowds, example, would bump into each other. So I, I, I kind of just thought that was a bit strange. But again, this idea of some clubs and these clubs and that clubs, I'm kind of interested in my club. And you see, we've exceeded and made every single regulation we get hit with and we're happy to do it and you're saying how the girls are self-employed and there's a lack of customers the girls that go obviously make money and it doesn't matter how many customers if it's quiet it, you know one million is as good as you know many and all people who are spending the same money and the same things and also when the way the girls are looked upon by men I see my girlfriend my future wife is a dancer and you know how she's looked upon by men you know done no damage to her, she's more than happy, you know. So I, I don't really see why you could just categorise everything with the one thing. You know, every girl's different and every club's different. I, I, I'm so, I've, got a list, I've got a list of people, Sandra. I will let you come back. Professor Hubbard, please. Uh, I just wanted to return to the issue of advertising. In general, I am in favour of the introduction of this new... Uh, power, because I think that licensing does provide flexibility and discretion to local authorities, which the planning system doesn't. It allows people to react to changes in a way that once you've been given the initial permission, perhaps the planning uh, committee is not the right uh, remit for doing this. One thing I would note is, of course, that the system has to be proportionate. The fees have to be uh, not contrary to EU uh, competition rules, uh, and particularly the EU services directive, which should suggest that any uh, particular business should not be unfettered by unfair uh, legisl legislation, should be over-regulated. One thing I would say in relation to advertising is that at the moment this is proposing an amendment to the 1982 Civic Government Act and the schedule on sex shops, which mentions the uh, control of advertising in or on the sex shop premise. I think that should be amended through this revision to read on, in or in the vicinity of, because one of the things that's occurring in England and Wales is that A-frames are being located on the street indicating lap dance this way. Again, they might not be mentioned within licensing conditions, given the current framing of the Sex Shops Act. Also, one is finding touting, pamphleting and so on. And adding in the vicinity of would allow licensing committees to impose fairly common sense rules, I think, and conditions on advertising in, on, or in the vicinity of uh, premises which are licensed for sexual entertainment. Laura Thompson, please. Um, on the point around uh, communities complaining around planning or around um, sexual entertainment values or around alcohol licences, I think, you know, the point of this regime should be to make it easy for local communities to complain or to raise an objection when they feel like on Lothian Road, those advertising signage outside the, the um, venues isn't suitable two streets away from a school. And I think when, you know, different things are covered by different planning or licensing authorities, then that makes it very confusing for them. So I think bringing that under, that the point should be to bring this all under sexual entertainment venue licensing. So that makes it easy for them to do. And I think, um, just to respond to Andrew Cox, who said that, you know, all venues are different and all managers are different and all the women who work there are different. That is the point. That is the point and that is why the licensing should be mandatory and should be coherent across Scotland because just because one venue is run effectively doesn't mean that they all are. Do you have examples, uh, Laura, that you've maybe dealt with 
um, where folks have gone from pillar to post with their objection. And that their objection may not be necessarily against the venue per se, but might be round about some of the advertising. Yeah, I, th and I think, you know, different people object to different things, and there are probably people out there who feel comfortable with things happening as long as their children don't have to walk past it to school every morning and you know and it's very obvious around Lothian Road area what's happening and they're very objectifying views of, of girls and women and we know that there's more and more research linking that to violence against women linking that to inequality and yeah I think um, I think it's important that they get to you know they might have some objections to that and they get to raise in a way that's very simple I mean I've Colleagues have raised objections about the signage on Lothian Road. Nothing's happened, even though, as far as we can see, it does, it does contravene policy. And we were told that um, we've taken our eyes off these places by the people that we spoke to. So I, I personally don't see, in our experience, that this is happening. This is functioning well at the moment. Okay. Sandra, I'll let you come back briefly, but I have got other folks in the, in the list. No, that's absolutely fine. I, I just wanted to say to Andrew that I didn't make up the rules about the churches and schools. That's part of the parcel of, and I think Janet explained that. Uh, I'll leave you that. To, the, there was one issue that I wanted to come in on that nobody else has mentioned, and this is about this immigration and licence toolkit. Yeah. Is it OK to mention that? Just Go ahead, yeah. I know it's something different. Uh, I just wondered, you know, I, I spoke to Janet earlier and she's going to send me this immigration and licence toolkit. I just wondered, I've never heard that put forward for any other form of employment. Can I just say as well that you mentioned earlier that um, the committee has caught sight of that uh, and in speaking to the clerks, we don't have that information. And I think it would be extremely useful um, for, for us to, to have that information uh, so that we can uh, have a look at it in, in terms of our deliberations. We would be delighted to send that in. We did put it in as part of our sexual entertainment venues consultation response. And uh, we are sorry that it hasn't come to the MSPs and everybody else around this table. But we'll certainly make sure it's sent to your Could committee that have clerk. Been to the government response rather than to the committee's call for evidence? Uh, yes, it would have been. Uh, which is a separate process. So if you could send it With pleasure. to our clerks and we can arrange that uh, afterwards, that would, be, that would be really grand. Thank you. Thank you. Will I see the toolkit then, Chair? Is that all right? I think that would that's, be the best way forward. And we'll make that sure that that's disseminated yeah. uh, to yourself as well, Sandra, as Thank well you. as to other committee members. Um, uh, Willie Coffey, please. Thanks very much, Convener. I wonder if I could um, ask our City Council colleagues to clarify the issue in relation to financial gain. Uh, both made submissions about perhaps a lack of clarity in the Bill's proposals about this. Could you first of all tell us just exactly what your concern is how it might be addressed and tidied up within the provisions in the bill and perhaps what the response of the club operators or associates and colleagues might, might have in response to that, please. Mary Miller first, please. Thank you. Um, my, my concern would be that it would allow um, an, almost like an escape provision that it would be arguable that the organi or the, the premises owner wasn't making any financial gain, that it was something that was being laid on free of charge, for example, and their uh, financial gain was through the sale of alcohol or some other activity. And I think it's something which then would obviously require to um, be litigated in order to determine whether or not that they were properly making financial gain. And I think it's, it's really a concern over the interpretation that may be given to that. And then again, the difficulty around trying to enforce uh, Eric Anderson, please. I, again, I find myself uh, endorsing um, very much what Mary Miller has been, been saying. Um, I, again, um, I would say the definition appears pr pretty well su sufficient, but um, uh, some more clarity may be, may be useful. I'm, one general point I'd like, we were going to make was that um, it was in interesting that um, in view, looking at the um, changes overall to the 1982 Act and what's gone before, that uh, a similar provision for the payment of money or money's worth has recently been removed from the licensing of places of public entertainment, and yet there's the concern that uh, there's the financial gain element is um, to be stipulated in this particular activity. And, um, th but that's just a a general comment that we make in terms of the Act. Thank you. Anyone else in, in that point? Uh, Professor Hubbard, please. Yeah, again, I think this is a red herring. The 
provisions here are clearly direct or indirect. And there's been no case, again, in England where anybody has challenged the idea that somebody providing free striptease entertainment may be benefiting indirectly from increased patronage, which results in increased alcohol sales. So I think the definition is adequate in that sense. My concern is, and again, licensing authorities and licensing solicitors advise me of this, that at the moment there's a disjunction here where it says a definition of sexual entertainment is live performance or live display. I think it should read a live performance involving live nudity because at the moment it could just involve a live display of nudity. Now, a live display of nudity means that that would then begin to include massage parlours, because in a massage parlour there, there is a live display of nudity in some instances, where a massage is provided by somebody who is topless or is naked. We know this goes on. It is advertised, so it is known to be for the purpose of sexual stimulation. There is financial gain for the organiser who runs the massage parlour, even if he denies knowledge of that or she denies knowledge of that. So there is a danger with the way that these things are currently framed, that this does bring massage parlours into the equation. And although we would like to turn a blind eye to the fact that this goes on in Scotland, as in England and Wales, we do know that saunas and massage parlours are known and advertised as spaces where sex is purchased. There needs to be an additional clause inserted uh, which suggests under 45A paragraph 7 that this act should exclude any premise resorted to or used by more than one woman or man for the purposes of prostitution or fornication. Otherwise, one could get into a situation where a licensing board on a very good day could decide to issue a, ma a massage parlour, a sexual entertainment licence, and therefore you have a civic regime which is licensing massage parlours contrary to the criminal law which forbids the running of a brothel or a disorderly house. Now, this hasn't been challenged in England and Wales yet, but it's going to be challenged soon. Let Hood, please. I'm quite surprised at um, Professor Hubbard's comments. It appears that we should be turning a blind eye to prostitution and serious abuse of women. But if that's the case, then uh, that uh, would be rather depressing. I would say that the main point for local government, however, and I have 21 years' experience as um, uh, uh, clerking boards and committees in local government, I think the major problem for local government is going to be the challenge of trying to marry two separate definitions. Adult entertainment is defined differently to sexual entertainment. I think it would be almost impossible to decide which way um, anybody is going to determine what is happening in premises. I think this on, of itself could tie local government up, not only in the local courts, but certainly in courts first of Scotland, should this legislation come in. And my clients are particularly concerned about this because it will be impossible to get the two regimes to marry. My clients of themselves would certainly be happy if grandfather rights were issued to those places which are currently operating under the system safely and properly regulated system under the Licensing Scotland Act and would hope that the government would be looking at the licensing of sexual entertainment venues to come in for new places. But if you don't manage to marry up the two definitions, this is definitely going to cause enormous cost and enormous difficulty for local government. This has been canvassed by Jack Cummings, it's been canvassed by Stephen McGowan, and it's been canvassed by other people who've appeared before this committee. And I think it's something that you're going to have to take on board and decide how that works. The last question on that point is, what are you going to do about the places that are currently licensed under the Licensing Scotland Act 2005 to provide adult entertainment? They have been deemed fit to provide adult entertainment. There's been no slipping in under the rug. There's been no slipping in under the, count the counter. Under the 76 Act, you had to declare the type of entertainment that took place in these premises. This was accepted by licensing boards then, with all the location, etc., stuff that we've talked about before. Under the 2005 Act, the activities had to be declared. These premises have been deemed to be fit for these activities to take place. How are you going to marry that up with this new regime? If, for instance, Glasgow, which is already in the press, declared that they want a zero number, which is rather odd because they haven't considered anything, um, of these premises in Glasgow, how are they going to deal with the premises that already exist, which are providing legitimate activities in a well-regulated setup? How are they going to remove that consent from the licensed premises in terms of the 2005 Act? I think that is a quandary for everybody. Um, John Morgan, please. Uh, definitions and exclusions. I'd like to just explore 
potential implications for theatre and dance and other kinds of legitimate life uh, And maybe while you're at it, you can talk to us about uh, a number of, of your practical concerns about the, the proposed uh, new uh, legislation on theatres, because I know that we have uh, kind of missed out. Uh, well, I wasn't sure what was the right moment to come in. <laughs> you you um, go ahead, sir. OK, so just dealing with sexual entertainment venues licence, first of all, we don't have a position on the substantive uh, proposal, but uh, we're certainly not speaking in opposition to it. The, our main concern is around the definition of sexual entertainment as it's currently constituted and the potential impact on the freedom of artistic expression for legitimate artists. Um, elsewhere in the bill, we're pleased to see that there are provisions to continue the ban against censorship, which was in the 68 Theatres Act, and also uh, the, 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 uh, uh, the st stopping local authorities from, from attaching conditions to pu uh, public entertainment licenses around which plays may be performed or the manner in which may they may be performed. So those safeguards, those freedom of artistic expression safeguards are very important. Our concern is that this part of the bill might inadvertently, although we know that's not the intention, might inadvertently have an impact on that uh, freedom of artistic expression. We surveyed our members about this and they were unanimous in their concerns around this. I suppose those concerns are threefold. One is potential misinterpretation or misapplication of the sexual entertainment venues licensing to restrict unreasonably a legitimate artistic performance. The potential for vexatious complaint by individual members of the public on the grounds perhaps of taste or decency rather than on the grounds of this being a, a, an example of sexual entertainment. And indeed self-censorship by our own sector people out of fear of falling foul of this uh, uh, legislation simply choosing not to uh, uh, to put on a particular performance or production. The sorts of things I'm talking about, I, I have examples, but I probably won't go into detail about them now, are burlesque artists, artists whose uh, performances are exploring questions of sex, sexuality, prostitution, pornography. Um, there are examples like uh, the production Wonderland that was on at the Inter Edward International Festival um, two years ago, uh, which explicitly explored uh, pornography and involved uh, nudity on stage. Um, there was a performance at the festival last year called Sister, which uh, were involved a lap dance, in fact, as part of the performance to demonstrate uh, um, the, the different attitudes of the women in the performance to, to uh, uh, sexual performance in that way. So we're concerned that those kinds of performances, which are really pushing at the boundaries of taste and decency for many people, but are not illegal, uh, may fall foul of this, this the, the definition. So we have some proposals about how the definition might be changed and also we would uh, request that under 45A section 7 there's an exemption for venues with a public entertainment licence and also an explicit exemption for artistic or the theatrical performances whose intention is artistic or creative. I noted when there was a consultation on this in June, in tw June 2013 when the consultation came out, in the guidance notes to the consultation there was an explicit statement that this was not intended to inadvertently uh, affect artistic performances, but that explicit statement doesn't exist anywhere in the bill at present, and so we'd like to see that in the bill and in the accompanying guidance. Thank you very much. Uh, Professor Hubbard, please. To defer slightly from that in the sense that 45A paragraph 3 already indicates that sexual entertainment indicates a live performance or live display of nudity which can be reasonably assumed whether by verbal or other means to be provided solely or principally for the purpose of sexual stimulation of an audience. I think our understanding would be that an artistic performance or theatrical performance will not be construed as solely or principally for, sexual, for the purpose of sexual stimulation. Now, one could add, and it may be prudent to do so, I'm advised, uh, whether by verbal or other means, including advertising. And to add that there, because I think there's a very clear difference in the sense that I could set up a premise called Bottoms Up, for example, or Cuddles, or something along those lines. And the, and the act of advertising in that way would indicate the entertainment I'm providing is there for the purpose of sexually stimulating. If I have a premise called a Theatre, I think that becomes very clear that the, my primary objective is not sexual stimulation, but artistic entertainment. Yeah, on you go, Mr uh, Morgan. Here in Edinburgh during the Fringe, there are lots of venues that are not normally called theatre, which become theatres during, during the festival, for, for the sake of argument. So I'm not sure that that would be, provide sufficient protection. At this point in time, there have been similar instances, but I think, again, by nature of advertising, a common sense view would be that verbal or other means, including advertising, would indicate that a programme of entertainment was there as part of a particular cultural season. Now, if it was indicated somewhat differently that this was about sexual stimulation, 
then I think the, the outcome will be very different. But I do think this is somewhat of a red herring, and I think the current legislation, as framed, makes adequate provision for local authorities to distinguish between what is exempt. If I was wanting to get round to some of the regulations, I may actually uh, say that my venue was a theatre rather than anything else, where some of the original venues for sexual entertainment in Soho not dubbed as theatres at one mm -hmm. point. Mm -hmm. I, th I don't think that instance is likely to occur, and I think that in terms of the advertising and the likely patronage, I think that particular routes would be unlikely. There has been no event of this happening in the last five years in England and Wales. OK, John Wilson, please. Thank you, Convener. It's just to further ask Mr Morgan about this issue about theatre performances, because one of the fears that I have is that because of the, pre the way the bill is presently laid out, that different licensing authorities may take different interpretations of a theatre production. So you could have a theatre production taking place in Glasgow that has live nudity. The same theatre production then tries to uh, go into, say, West Dunbartonshire or East Dunbartonshire or North Lanarkshire, and the licensing authority there decides it is not fit uh, to, for uh, showing in those areas. So part of the, the difficulty that I have, Convener, is trying to ensure that the legislation that, that, as it comes in has the same effect throughout Scotland, that no audiences in Glasgow uh, have the same rights as the audiences elsewhere in Scotland. And, and that's part of the difficulty, is that we are then relying on 32 licensing authorities interpreting the legislation as laid before it. And I do feel, and Mr Morgan can comment on this, there may be an issue about artistic licence being uh, taken away from theatre productions. Uh, that try, and, and this is a difficulty in terms of trying to define uh, the, a legislation in such a way that doesn't allow uh, artistic in, interpretation to be taken away from some areas and not in others, uh, based on the decisions of licensing boards. I mean, that's certainly our concern. The phrase must reasonably be assumed uh, means there's interpretation involved in that and subjectivity as well. And we are concerned that different local authorities or local licensing boards may take a different view on the same show, on the same production, as, as, as Mr. Wilson has said. Um, and uh, we feel that the simple inclusion of, of a, a, a clause that says this excludes legitimate artistic performances uh, or theatre performances uh, and also the exclusion around PELs would, would, would uh, provide sufficient safeguard around that. I take your point about someone potentially saying, well, I run a theatre and I've got a public entertainment licence, but we're talking, it's about proportionality for me. There are hundreds of theatres and community arts venues up and down the country, and we're talking about 20 sexual entertainment venues. Surely it must be possible to, check, to, to, to verify whether someone is legitimately running a theatre or a sexual entertainment venue. I'm going to let Mr Wilson come back here, but if, if he doesn't pick up on this, I, I, I will. But you can pick up on your point, because I was going to move on. It's the definition of legitimate theatre performance, you know, because you and I may think that something is a legitimate theatre performance uh, and others may not. Um, and it is that definition in law. You know, I... I, I, I often think that, you know, sometimes the more that we legislate mm. for things, uh, the more that we create a rod for our own backs mm. in some mm. regards, um, because these definitions often cause us great, great difficulties. Well, there is already a definition in the Theatres Act which will still uh, subs subsist uh, under the new bill, because not all of the Theatres Act is being repealed um, uh, in this. So there, is, so there is a definition of play. Uh, and theatrical, uh, which, which would cover a legitimate theatrical performance in, in the bill. So one could use that uh, um, definition. OK, John. Thank you. To, to follow on from the point made by Laura Thompson earlier about the signage outside premises, and just to seek clarification, and maybe some of the round table can clarify this, the difficulty I have is that licensing of premises is done by the licensing board or licensing committee. Uh, the display of signage then comes up under the planning regulations. Uh, and is, has there been any discussion uh, regarding the crossover between what is actually acceptable by the licensing board in terms of premises and then, as uh, Ms Thompson's indicated, the displaying of signage outside those premises falling into the planning authority 
regime rather than into the licensing regime? And are people clear about wh whether or not, when they make a complaint about signage, they're complaining to the same department? And how, the, and this might be the licensing officers in the room, might be able to clarify what the linkage between the planning department and the licensing uh, department board is in relation to ensuring that the signage does not infringe on the, the decency of uh, residents or other uh, citizens within the area concerned. Laura Thompson, please. Um, I, I don't have an answer to that. I mean, the, the reason that we think it should, it should come under um, the licensing of the venue is because, I mean, as far as I'm aware, and I'm not an expert on this, planning happens, you know, the objections to planning are able to be raised once, whereas a school or a, a religious uh, centre could be built down the street from somewhere that's already had um, planning permission given for a certain type of signage, and, and then there's nothing that the community can do about that, as well as the fact that it is very convoluted for local people to understand who they should approach. Okay, um, I'm going to take in the licensing um, folk, and uh, I imagine that some of the areas that the clubs are in um, are in areas which may be conservation zones or may have other planning strictures round about them. Um, and I don't know if you would want to make comment on that, because that would allow, if that were the case, not just that single application for objection, but uh, an ongoing scenario, if necessary. Mr Anderson. I, I can um, refer to one case a few years ago where we did have, indeed, a situation whereby premises had... Uh, I think we were wishing to expand and had signs displayed which had led to a number of complaints from members of the public. Um, to an extent, these went to the local authority in general. Some went to planning and some went to the licensing board. And as far as the uh, as dealing with that, we put everything to the planning, the, the planners who were able to... Um, investigate and as a result the uh, offending signs were amended and adapted um, and di to displayed within the accepted uh, terms. That application or was that something um, that had been in existence for a while and changed? These, these, were, these were fairly new premises and they were, um, as I say, they were expanding their business, they were wishing to uh, develop and uh, I guess um, it was some form of advert, and um, it's in the eye of the beholder as far as the signs are concerned, but nevertheless it did um, attract quite a number of complaints, and the, the, the issue was dealt with fairly quickly, I must say. Uh, Mary Miller, please. Hey, um, the approach we take is that there is entirely separate regimes between licensing and planning, and the two do not cross over, and I think that in my experience, tends to be the biggest single uh, frustration for members of the public, and certainly a, a big misconception that one cannot uh, one cannot enforce the other. And people do come to the licensing section to complain about advertising and licensed premises, but become frustrated that it's not sit, doesn't sit within the licensing board to, to deal with that issue. And we have simply to pass it on to planning. But people, members of the public, do um, struggle with that distinction. I take it that you've got a level of cooperation in your local authority where the licensing board will uh, actually uh, deal with the planning department and pass on any of these complaints? Certainly if I received a complaint I would pass it on to my colleagues in planning to deal with but I wouldn't necessarily uh, request a report back on the issue because there would, wouldn't be anything I could really do with that information. Okay. Uh, Professor Hubbard please. I'm sorry Chair again to come in on this but it is in my area of expertise and I just refer to a, a, a case law example in uh, South Buckinghamshire in 2003 where the local authority uh, gave planning permission for a lap dance club in a rural location and approved signage, advertising, uh, elevation, had all that information, approved it. And then two weeks later, the licensing committee rejected the license application. It's entirely possible for a licensing committee to draw completely different conclusions from the same kind of sets of evidence than a planning. They are separate regimes and case law suggests they can be treated as such by moving the control of advertising into the licensing regime, you do have that flexibility through annual renewal to see what has been happening uh, and to impose new conditions on signage and advertising in or on or in the vicinity of a particular premise. So it would seem sensible to acknowledge that and give uh, licensing committees uh, that particular 
uh, control. The contradiction between the two regimes and the fact that they don't have to pay much attention to one another is interesting and unresolved as far as I can see, given they are both considering the material effect of a premise on the locality. And this legislation is particularly mindful of the impact of uh, a premise on the locality, the locality to be decided in accordance with the facts of the application. And again, a locality could be defined differently by a planning committee to a licensing committee. It cannot be defined in advance. OK. Uh, Janet Hood, please. Just a very quick point on the advertising. In the Licensing Scotland Act 2005, there is an objective which is to prevent public nuisance. If people are offended and upset by signage, I suggest that that would be a route in which they could make complaint to the licensing board, and the licensing board would have a legitimate reason for at least looking at the effect of signage, and they would no doubt report back to the planning service. If somebody changes the sign, and I know this because my clients do this all the time, if it was called Janet Hood's Hotel today, and then it was called Stuart Stevenson's Hotel tomorrow, you would require to get planning consent for the new sign, even though there was nothing offensive, hopefully, in either of these two names. So it's quite important that the committee realises this. It appears to me that the signage that has been approved um, there must be Edinburgh City Council in the Lothian Road area. It must have been something that the local authority, that is who the planning committee are, they're part of the local authority, um, have made a decision on, and that is subject to ratification at council level. So we have to be careful. The licensing board is undoubtedly the appropriate place to deal with venues of this type. They have the powers to control these matters, and this dual um, licensing, I think, will confuse the issue and actually make it harder for the public to know where to bring complaint or attack. Um, I think one of the things which is uh, maybe a little bit difficult for us today in terms of the um, signage aspects is not having anyone from the uh, planning section here. Um, we may have to write to authorities and ask for clarification uh, round about how they deal with it. I would imagine that some of these uh, issues are dealt with under delegated powers to officers rather than by planning com committees per se. Uh, and it may well be that some of the difficulties uh, lie in that there is not uh, uh, an elected member overview at some points, but we may uh, need to write to some planning uh, committees uh, or to local authorities to get their planning view on that, uh, and we will do so. Um, Cameron Buchanan was next, please. Thank you. I just wanted to pick up on Professor Hubbard's point. I think the word vicinity is very important for signage. These A boards sometimes are spread all over the place. I think that's probably not very helpful, but that really wasn't the point I was going to make. I wanted to ask the panel what they thought of these occasional licenses. We haven't cut this. This, this is a point that was covered you know, about exemption for venues to host sexual entertainments on no more than four occasions a year. What does the panel think about that? Because I couldn't gather what people thought. We've already covered some of that. Well, some of it, but not... Does anyone else want to come in on this? Mary Miller, do you want to...? In support of um, the, the, four, the exemption. I don't think there should be a de minimis rule. OK. Eric Anderson? Yes, I would. I would agree with Mary. Any, anything else in that? We agree with that as well. Right. Um, Willie Coffey? I was convened. I wonder if I could ask the panel their views on the proposal to permit those who are under 18 to work in the premises, albeit out with the operational hours of, of the entertainment. Would the panel have a view on that? Any views on under 18s working in the premises out with the opening hours? Janet Hood, please. Our clients have nobody under the age of 18 working in the premises, I, and I don't think that that is something that uh, would occur. It's um, these premises, such and other licensed premises, are often not suitable for persons under the age of 18 to work in. Laura Thompson, please. I would disagree with Janet that when we're talking about a premises, not just activity happening with the premises, and it's to do with the kind of um, images you have within the premises, it's to do with I would argue the attitudes and the, you know, the daily work of most of the people who work there, it's not, it's not appropriate for under 18s to be in there. Okay, Professor Hubbard. This particular clause has been added in relation to equalities legislation, which would suggest that anybody of working age would, ought to be able to have employment within a premise. So, I, again, there may be issues there in relation to age of consent as well coming into play. OK. Any other views on that particular aspect? Um, no. OK. Um, Sandra White, first of all, please. Uh, thank, you, thank you very much, convener. Uh, I, I wanted to raise the issue of the artistic performance and expression. I think that's a, a very important one. And 
basically we have we have said that this bill would not have that effect. And I think you've admitted that also. But you've also teased out various areas uh, too. The, the importance of this bill and the premise of this bill is to enable local authorities to license these types of premises which provide this type of sexual entertainment. It's nothing to do at all with artistic expression, where you have a theatre, where there's visiting theatre companies. Uh, every so often, it's a different type of entertainment that's put on there. So it's absolutely nothing at all to do with that. And I'd like to say that to, to John and others who have, who have raised these concerns. Even at this moment in time, with the licensing laws and the laws we have at the moment, you will find that in some areas, local authorities will not allow some form of entertainment, artistic expression in their theatres, and yet in other council areas, it happens there. So at the moment, you've got the anomaly of the local authorities pushing that forward too. I think this would actually clarify it better to put in... I mean, I, I, <clears throat> the committee is looking at the, the bill, but perhaps there is somewhere for on the face of the bill to make sure that this is put forward. But it's no way at all to stop the artistic expressions, in particular when you've got places like the Edinburgh Festival and various other, uh, you know, fantastic entertainment venues. There's no way to affect that at all. I just wanted to say that to you. Thank you. Mr Morrigan? For that reassurance, uh, uh, and we do understand that that's not the intention or the purpose of the bill, so it's not that we're... What we'd like, is, uh, as you suggested, is that there's some explicit statement of that within the bill so that that's really, really clear for, uh, as guidance for local authorities. I'd like to come in at some point about theatres and public entertainment licences, even though it's a completely I, different subject. I, I intend to manage to get all of that okay, in, fine. Mr. Mr Morrigan. Um, Alec Crowley, please. Yeah, can I maybe pick up on that? And I know that in Glasgow's evidence, they talk about the, the Cinemas Act 1985 and, and that consideration should be given to repeal that. And it's, it's this question of whether there's practical concerns in moving across um, to a, a new licensing regime and what those concerns might be. Ms Miller? I think it's part of a, a, a wider submission that we're making in terms of having so many different um, licensing acts and regulations and if you look at the system they have in England and Wales where it effectively is all covered by the one licensing, uh, licensing act 2003 where you have a single premises license which authorises all the different various activities and we're, we're some way removed from that in Scotland um, and I think it is a significant step forward that the Theatres Act in terms of licensing uh, that this bill is looking to repeal that and put it under generally the public entertainment under the Civic Government Scotland Act and I think uh, something that has been missed is the old Cinemas Act which still continues to be there but again hasn't been looked at for such a long time and I think it would be um, progress to bring that within the, certainly the Civic Government Act to bring it uh, so that there aren't so many separate licences required. Okay, thank you. Mr Anderson. Say that as far as licensing legislation is concerned, I use that very broad term, I think consolidation is what we need. Since the 2005 Act, if I talk about liquor licensing, for example, we have the Act, we've got about 40-odd statutory instruments to add to that, and there's been two, and now th two, two further Acts, um, the Criminal Justice and Licensing Scotland Act, the Alcohol Etc. Scotland Act, now the Air Weapons and Licensing Scotland Bill, and um, two of those acts are adding uh, bits and pieces of legislation to the 1982 Act. And whatever is needed, it's consolidation and not bits added on in a piecemeal basis. And so I heartily um, endorse what Mary is saying as far as uh, looking at the Cinemas Act, for example, in adding that in, 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 in any event, a, a far broader um, consolidation is what is what we need for the licensing legislation. Thank you very much for that. That's extremely useful. Uh, does anyone else want to come in uh, on that point? Uh, Alec Rowley, do you want to come back? Um, I one... have a quick point just to make on the differences uh, between licensing boards. It's very brief. I think it would be very unwise to try to fetter the decision making of licensing boards or licensing committees or indeed planning committees. I think we have to allow for local um, decision making, whether it's for sexual entertainment venues, alcohol licensing or any other form of licensing. And I don't think it would be the purpose of the Scottish Government to try to impose a draconian regime that had to be followed by elected members who are considering the requirements of what happens in their communities. And I would cite, just for interest, 
the fact that the life of Brian was banned in Glasgow for 20 years. Emmanuel was barred in certain rural cinemas for years. These are films that could openly be viewed virtually everywhere else in Scotland. Those were decisions taken by local government for whatever reasons they had, and whether or not we approve them, they were taken legitimately by people who have concern for people in their areas. And this is something that my clients recognise. My clients' position is not the differences between local government, it's that they should be treated fairly and the way they operate should be recognised. Uh, that leads me to the inevitable question then. Um, should uh, these authorities have the ability to set the number of venues at zero um, within their authority area? Ms Miller. I think they should, the local authorities should be given the power to set them at zero. However, and I think um, this falls on from a point Janet made earlier, there would have to be a significant amount of research and evidence gathered in order to determine the appropriate number uh, by each individual local authority. And certainly it's not uh, my position on behalf of the local authority that the number would automatically be zero. It would have to be based on a, a wide-ranging consultation and evidence gathering process. But I think they should have the ability to limit the number, including setting, setting the number at zero. But I think what is important is that there has to be clear guidance and regulations in relation to to the situation regarding existing licensed premises as to whether or not they are to be given grandfather rights. Uh, Mr Anderson. Yes, uh, the local authority should be given the flexibility to consider the number of premises in their locality. That said, that indeed there has to be, it, it can't just be arbitrary. It has to be done in a proper way with proper evidence set forth and any guidance and proper legislation um, to assist the local authorities in making that decision would be very welcome. Professor Hubbard. I have quite strong views on this. I think the whole notion of setting a nil limit in advance is legally unreasonable, undefensible, and I think it also creates a huge burden of proof onto the local authority to demonstrate in advance that there are no suitable localities uh, within which sexual entertainment could occur, and I think that's extremely burdensome. It means that local authorities have to draw up a policy that reviews the number of localities that are present and establish a basis for why they shouldn't have sexual entertainment present. That policy would have to be renewed on an annual basis because localities change annually and that will create a huge burden for local authority officers. So I would strike a reference to the nil uh, limit in paragraph 5, subsection 5. I would also, in that regard, have be mindful of situations such as Andrew's Club, which has been running lawfully for a good number of years. If it meets a nil limit, I think that's legally unreasonable. I think that the clause should very clearly be in this uh, legislation that says every case should be decided on its merits in relation to the facts of the case to provide ultimate flexibility to local authorities to do exactly that. Andrew, you were mentioned there. Do you want to, to say anything on this particular area? Yeah, no, I'm fine. OK, thank you. Um, Eric, you want to come back in? Could, if I could just mention the, um, the new paragraph 5A in the, in, the, in the draft, which states that for the purposes of uh, 5C, which is what we're talking about just now, um, a local authority must from time to time determine the appropriate number of sexual entertainment venues for their area and for each relevant locality and, and publicise the determination in such manner as they consider appropriate. It's the words, and from time to time. So that is that if a local authority do determine a number of um, these venues in their locality, even if that is zero, then they must from time to time determine. that. Those, these words are very general, too general, I would say, and I would be looking to see um, something more specific to, uh, in order to, so that the local authority can get proper guidance on that. I would have thought that um, if they must, if the word must is, it has to be remained, I had thought originally uh, a, local, a, local, a local authority may, if they consider it appropriate or uh, um, uh, reasonable, um, would from time to time. But if it is must, then not from time to time, a more specific time limit would be um, very welcome. Thank you. Laura Thompson, please. Um, I don't think it would be any surprise that we would support local authorities being able to have a nil limit. I think it's up to the local authority to decide if that's suitable for them. And I think it's completely appropriate that local authorities decide that based on their own violence against women and equality policies. I think that's a completely reasonable rationale for that. 
Please. The um, matter could easily be dealt with by the Licensing Scotland Act 2005, which permits licensing boards to consider over provision not only on numbers within their area but on the types of premises. As has been pointed out by many people around this committee, it is hardly difficult to um, uh, spot an adult entertainment venue. There are 17 in Scotland. They are quite overt, and um, it would be easy for licensing boards to say this. The Aberdeen Licensing Board canvassed when uh, I had my application refused on behalf of a client um, the fact that overprovision might come into this because at that time there were eight venues in Aberdeen, and the chairman of the board had stated that she was concerned about overprovision, though that was not what the decision was made on in the end. But these, these aspects of law already exist in the Licensing Scotland Act, and this is something the challenge is for boards to decide to take them up. It does not require new legislation, and I think this committee has to consider whether this legislation is actually necessary. Stuart Stevenson. Um, there are a few benefits of being older than colleagues, but one of them is you remember things that others might not remember. You may recall, and I think it was 1964 that were abolished, the veto poll provisions uh, on alcohol licensing and I think the last where basically people in a ward voted as to whether they would allow any licensed premises at all and I think the last area in Glasgow to have a veto was Cathcart is my distant uh, uh, memory so uh, you know there are ways in which this in the past has been handled but equally that provision was abolished uh, my grandfather who is a Rehabite would no doubt uh, uh, be desirous of bringing it back to this day but I suspect today the communities would be unlikely to vote for such a provision but I think we shouldn't discount there are ways in which one can add legitimacy to a community quite properly uh, taking the decision that this is not the kind of thing it wants in its community, and indeed on other matters uh, as well. Thank you. Um, now, I intend to turn to um, the, the theatre licensing aspects. And um, Mr Morrigan, I, I, I appreciate your patience today because I realise that a lot of this has been around about sexual entertainment. Um, can I, can I ask you, Mr Morgan, uh, a couple of questions round about um, the, the theatre aspects? Uh, can I ask you uh, whether you have concerns about the fact that some theatres may be exempt from the requirement to hold a public entertainment licence uh, because they have a, a licence to sell alcohol? Uh, and I'd appreciate anyone else who wants to come in on this as well. Mr Morgan. I think, um, I think we welcome the, the, the fact that this simplifies things somewhat. Um, as Mr Anderson and Ms Miller have both said, it could be simplified even further into a single licensing regime for premises that would cover alcohol, theatre, cinema, um, as well as, as, as is the case in England. So it certainly helps simplify things uh, for some venues uh, within our membership purely only hold a theatre licence at the moment. Some hold both a theatre and a PEL, even though they didn't need to. Uh, but, but because there's confusion sometimes at, at, uh, uh, in some venues, they weren't sure, so they've held both. And certainly village and community halls up and down the country who typically would have a, an alcohol licence or maybe a PEL, but wouldn't have a theatre licence, will now no longer have to apply for a temporary theatre licence for the occasional showing of a, uh, of a touring theatre company. So from that point of view, I think the fact there's flexibility between either operating within an alcohol license or PEL is welcome. The only concern is that alcohol licensing doesn't particularly give much guidance around the specifics of running a theatre venue and the safety issues around that. So we want to see uh, um, retention of those, of those uh, uh, rules and those uh, uh, licensing officers having a close relationship with theatres around safety issues because they are quite specific in theatres compared with, say, say uh, uh, pubs or other um, alcohol uh, establishments. The other question for us um, is around cost. Um, uh, there's huge variation across the country uh, between the cost of a, a, a PEL, let alone a theatre licence. So in one local authority area, it'll cost you £140 for a year if your venue is up to 5,000 seats. In another local authority area, it'll cost you £1,855 for the same size venue. So there's huge discrepancy. Uh, and one of the other things that the bill in uh, the, the regulations in England brought in, England and Wales, was consistent fees across the country for premises licences, which makes it much fairer and simpler for everybody concerned. So um, 
whilst this isn't within the remit of the current bill, we'd certainly like that to be considered, and we would certainly assume that, that there would be no reason why licensing authorities would need to increase the current cost of their public entertainment license because of these changes, and we would not be happy if that, if that were to happen, because in our view, this is simplifying things and making it cheaper and easier to do than rather than more expensive. Um, so those are our kind of main views on that. Mr. Anderson or Ms. Miller, do you have views on that? Ms. Miller? I certainly support um, the, the inclusion within public entertainment of the, the theatre licence provisions and the, the, the abolition of the, the separate licensing regime. Um, we actually already include theatres within our public entertainment resolution because having worked with those in the theatre trade, we recognise the difficulties in terms of applying for a theatre licence for the, the huge plethora of different types of premises and that's something which we took on board and certainly in terms of the fees as well. Uh, we have a broad range of fee categories which suit all these different types of premises so yes we, we would support the pr provisions within the bill. Uh, Mr Anderson. Um, supporting the provisions within the bill, I, it'll be interesting to see if the, if the bill becomes law um, in its terms, what the effect will be um, with regard to some premises which have gone for a theatre licence because they don't also require a public entertainment licence but just don't um, restrict themselves to the to um, producing plays, but may have other activities, and if they are, then. To uh, Mr. Anderson. Uh, well, we have we have premises um, out at the exhibition centre, for example, which has has a number of different ac activities dependent on the um, dependent dependent on their their programme, so that they could have um, plays or the or the performing of or playing of a role. Um, and they can also have different activities um, which could be um, to do with sport or other um, concerts, for example, a music um, venue, which can be covered by public entertainment licence, can be covered by theatre licence. If theatre is then, if, if, if that's all going to be changed to public entertainment, then the, um, rather than just having the theatre licence, they will have to have the public entertainment licence and have a variety of... Uh, activities, if they then wish to broaden their activities, named activities I'm talking about, if they then wish to broaden that, they will have to apply for variations. So that's just one of the uh, implications that can, that can, can result. Mr. Morgan, you looked a bit puzzled there. Yeah, I wasn't sure whether... Um, um, uh, surely all those things are, are included within the PEL anyway, so you don't have to vary but, the PEL. Uh, well, they, they, will, they will if the... If the premises has a theatre licence to sell, right. but yeah. then has to have a public en entertainment licence. By having a public entertainment licence, they must name their activities that they're going to, uh, to right. uh, carry out. Mm -hmm. So therefore, they name three activities, for example, which may include theatres. Mm -hmm. They wish then to add another activity, then they'll mm -hmm. have to apply for a variation. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, I what you're describing there is maybe an argument for consolidation, right enough. Uh, Ms Hood? I think it is, exactly. A lot of my uh, licensed premises, nothing to do with SCVs, you'll be pleased to hear, have theatre ticked on their activities. They also have cinema ticked on their activities. These are usually bigger premises, but often village premises where a variety of things occur in what used to be wedding function rooms, but they happen now. If this comes into force, does this mean that a public entertainment licence will have to be applied for for these licensed premises? There was a lacuna in the... Um, a Criminal Justice Act when the uh, requirement for late hours catering um, licences was brought in. Um, so that meant that places like, uh, uh, places like supermarkets, which had previously had 24-hour opening, not for the sale of alcohol, some local authorities decided that they had to get um, late hours catering licences to enable them to sell tins of beans, and others decided that they didn't. The 76 Act dealt with this by making the liquor licensing, if it was liquor licensed and covered um, uh, these things, then they were exempt. I think we should be making sure, and I think, as you say, consolidation might be the answer, that we don't have multiple licensing on premises, because that leads to confusion and difficulty, not only for local government licensing boards, but also the police enforcement officers, and more particularly for my clients or anybody's point of view, the trade. Uh, Mr Morgan, we kind of strayed away from theatres there. 
related, it's all related. Uh, I mean, my understanding is that within the uh, proposed legislation, in fact, within the existing 82 legislation, if you have a, a, a premises license for alcohol, providing you organize that entertainment during your licensing hours, you don't necessarily have to have a public entertainment license. So in, in one respect, this simplifies things, and in one respect, it complicates things, I think, because my understanding is that if I run a theater after this, if this bill is, is passed, uh, um, the local authority cannot oblige me to have a public entertainment license. I think I'm right in, in saying that. I could just simply say, I'm going to put on my plays and my dance performances, whatever, during the licensing hours for the alcohol license that I hold. I, I think I'm right in saying that. Is that correct? Yes, but as an exemption, uh, yes, that, that does not require a separate public entertainment license mm -hmm. where the, the activity is within identical hours or within the, the, the licensed hours within the the alcohol license. Mm. However, that is something which I do have a concern about because it more, it more in general terms, in terms of, um, again, this idea about unregulated activity because mm. of the restraints which have been placed upon the licensing board in terms of its ability to regulate matters going beyond the, the sale of alcohol. Mm. Um, Mr Anderson? Just for, just for an example, if you have a liquor license, then you have rules and regulations for carrying out... Um, sale of alcohol, but the, that could be in a theatre where you have all the props, all the, everything that goes with it, that's not necessarily co covered by the liquor licence. Okay. Um, uh, we will certainly try and clarify some of these points with, with government as well in terms of their intentions. Mr. Mr Morgan, do you have anything else that you want to bring to the attention to the committee around about theatres? Um, actually, this is, well, it's, it, this is a slightly kind of left field issue, but it's one that has been raised to me, raised with me by, by some of our members. Um, increasingly, people are, are, are performing in pubs, and the point was raised about how alcohol licenses can be used to, to, to permit performances. Um, and, but you have to make sure that on your operating plan you have ticked theatre. Uh, if you haven't done that, and many uh, licensees don't think of that when they first... Uh, apply for their license. In order to then decide to, to change their mind and put, put on a theatre play, even if it's a one-off performance, they have to apply for a major variation, not a minor one. It's not considered a minor variation, it's considered a major variation, which means, I believe, going back in front of the licensing board. So theatre companies are ex uh, who, are, who are increasingly performing in pubs, which is great in terms of accessing different audiences and a different demographic, um, theatres like the National Theatre of Scotland, the Village Pub Theatre in Leith, uh, are finding that pubs just won't do it because they don't want to go back before the licensing board for a full uh, review of their licence just for the purposes of putting on a play. So, again, I'm not sure whether this can be covered within this legislation or, 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 or somewhere else, but we would like to see that regraded as either a minor variation to their alcohol licence or for there to be provision for for pubs to be able to apply for a public entertainment licence on a temporary basis to put on a, a play. Because it seems a little bit of a sledgehammer to crack a nut that they have to go through a major a variation on their alcohol licence just to put on a play for one day. Thank you very much for that. Can I thank you all for your evidence today? That has been extremely useful indeed. Uh, and can I suspend the meeting for five minutes for a change of witnesses, please?
Uh, welcome back. Can I uh, welcome our next panellists, uh, who are Michael McDougall, Solicitor from Glasgow City Council, Gary Walker, Principal Policy Officer of the Waste Unit of National Operations of the Scottish Environmental Protection Agency, and Guy Jefferson, uh, Director, uh, SP Distribution, Scottish Power. Um, would you like to make any opening remarks, gentlemen? Mr Jefferson, do you want to go first? Well, good morning, convener. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to give evidence today, first of all. Uh, Scottish Power Energy Networks, we represent, maintain the electricity network in the central belt of Scotland. Uh, we also have uh, interests, infrastructure in, interests in England and Wales, so I guess we're well placed to look across those uh, three regimes and compare and contrast. Um, metal theft has been a serious problem for us over the last four years. We've had over 1,000 uh, incidents of, of attempted metal theft or actual metal theft to deal with. That's cost us in the region of £4 million in direct repairs, but you could probably double that if you take account of loss of revenue and also the amount of proactive security measures we've had to put in place. The cost is rather outweighed by uh, the risk to uh, health and safety, however. We have had a number of instances of fatalities of, uh, of thieves who have attempted to steal metal and also some what I would describe as near misses with uh, members of the public and customers uh, who have been affected by uh, metal thefts. It is not a, a victimless crime. Uh, on that basis, we fully support the legislation put forward and um, we, the key areas we wish to see included, and it is part of obviously our submission, uh, the removal of all cash transactions, uh, effective record retention, uh, verification of proof of identity for, for those selling metals, as we see that as, as, a, as a big deterrent. Also, establishment of an accreditation scheme or a list of registered uh, and compliant and trustworthy dealers, and also appropriate penalties for those uh, who found to have breached the legislation. I guess the other thing we, we do believe it's vital to uh, whatever the, the shape of that legislation is to put in a robust mechanism to implement the new processes and, and monitor them accordingly. Thank you. Mr Walker. Yes, thank you. If I could make a short opening statement. Oh, please thank do. You. Thank you again, um, once again, for inviting us to give evidence today. Um, as you may know, SEPA is Scotland's principal environmental regulator. Um, our main purpose is to protect and improve the environment, um, but it is also to contribute to the health and well-being of the people of Scotland and to the achievement of sustainable economic growth. SEPA is responsible for regulating environmental impacts of scrapyards through a system of waste management licensing, and we also uh, regulate waste carriers. While SEPA has no role in the implementation of a scrap metal dealers licensing system, there is an overlap um, between these, these regimes in terms of the businesses that are impacted and that are targeted by these regimes, albeit for entirely different purposes. SEPA welcomes this bill. We are concerned about metal theft and have been involved with Metal Thefts Task Force and in multi-agency work with British Transport Police and Police Scotland. Um, the bill offers a, a series of proposals to disincentivise metal theft. Mr McDougall, please. Thank you. Thank you again for the invitation today. Glasgow City Council has a licensing authority. We regulate scrap metal dealers. Glasgow City Council has for some time been concerned at the extent of metal theft at both a national and a local level. This is not just a matter of the financial implications, but also the risk to the public and also the perpetrators themselves has been touched on already. Uh, Glasgow City Council welcomes the proposals in this bill, especially the introduction of cashless payments and also the removal of the exemption warrant system. Um, Mr Jefferson, you, you talked of uh, a loss of some £4 million pounds and probably greater losses beyond that. Um, obviously, those costs are likely to be passed on to your customers, are they not? Yes, we have, we have an allowance as part of our regulatory regime, which we utilise, but the costs so far have gone well beyond that in terms of you know, what we've had to do, not only in, in performing repairs to our network, but... Uh, also the uh, proactive measures we've put in, security cameras, etc., uh, in order to make sure that we keep the, uh, the thieves out and the lights on. Uh, have there been any examples of uh, 
major safety uh, difficulties because of the theft of metal, or have you been lucky thus far? Um, I can give you a couple of examples. We've had a number. Um, probably the biggest issue that we had was a, a situation we had in Govan in, in Glasgow about three years ago. Uh, thieves um, got access to some uh, 132,000 volt cables uh, and set them on fire on the basis that they, they expected the, the, our protective systems to trip out those cables and then they could uh, basically saw them up and take them away and, and uh, sell them for scrap. They caused a major fire which closed the M8 at the time because of the smoke and it took away the infrastructure to the govern area of West End of, of Glasgow, uh, which put around about 30,000 customers at risk for a period of about three days while we repaired those actual cables. So we could have had a situation, we had to invoke the Gold Command Emergency um, Authority and we could have had a situation where govern would have been blacked out for repair time of, of, of a cable, about 36 hours. So we came very close to a very major incident with, with that particular incident. Others, we've seen theft in substations actually cause high fluctuating voltages to customers' premises, and that has caused house fires. <coughs> in, in Greenock, uh, about a year and a half ago, we had a situation uh, exactly like that. And um, we worked with uh, a member of the of Scottish Parliament who used to be on this committee, Stuart McMillan, he was involved directly with that incident. And we had uh, an elderly lady suffered from smoke inhalation because there was a small fire caused by that voltage uh, fluctuation in her premise. So those are two examples, but there are, there are a number uh, which I could relay. I think that's very useful, Mr Jefferson. Thank you. Cameron Buchanan, please. Thank you very much indeed. Um, I, having already heard some evidence, I wondered if this, this cash ban is obviously very... Um, very worthwhile and everything, but I was concerned also that because you've banned the cash, they, therefore somebody could pay by cheque, they could just go next door and cash the cheque. Therefore, photographic identification is obviously essential. Do you all think that the, uh, the purpose of um, banning cash is, 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 is right and that the photographic ID would be essential? Mr Walker, can we start with you, please? Yes, I mean, as, I, as I've said, we have no experience in the operation of the scrap metal dealer system. It's not something we're responsible for. However, as a regulator, we can understand the importance of, first of all, identifying the people involved in transactions. Um, we are undertaking some work through the Regulatory Reform Act, uh, Scotland 19, uh, 2014, to, to try and uh, improve our own identity checks when it comes to licensing. So we think that is a good uh, part of this, this bill. And we also um, understand and recognise the benefits of cashless transactions and making, making uh, metal theft less attractive or less easy and convenient for uh, metal thieves. Um, uh, Mr McDougall, please. Yes, the Licensing Authority is very supportive of the ban on cash payments and adoption of a cashless system where we view that this would be a vital tool in combating stolen metal entering the, the system through metal dealers and understand that the, the Act in England and Wales, the Scrap Metal Dealers Act 2013, that requires photographic identification. It sets out what I think it's a mix of photographic ID and also proof of address, a utility bill or the like. So I think we would be supportive of some, something similar being introduced along with this. Okay. Uh, Mr Jefferson, please. I think it would probably be appropriate to bring forward some evidence that we've seen in England and Wales where, as our co my colleague has suggested, the system's already in place, uh, both cashless and identification. Uh, we've seen a change, a, a, a big drop, first of all, in metal theft in England and Wales, uh, probably not wholly due to the legislation, but certainly uh, partly due to the legislation. And as part of that, we've seen almost a complete uh, removal of what I would call the opportunist theft, which are really the ones that you would expect to see transacting at the level we are talking about in terms of, of cash. Uh, and I believe that is almost wholly down to the fact that we have cashless uh, in England and Wales, plus we have the, the identification, photographic identification and CCTV in many situations. Mr. Buchanan, do you want to come back? I think I'm just going to come back. You don't think, for instance, somebody who's raising one of the submissions, that somebody coming just to, to sell their car, or, you know, get, get their car for scrap for a minimal amount, it would put them off and therefore they'd just dump the car? It was raising somebody's submission. Or somebody coming to, with their fridge, for example, for worth a fiver, 
do you think that would put them off, or would you just ban all tra cash transactions anyway? Mr what? Jefferson. My expertise in that is limited in that area, but I, I can comment on what we've seen in terms of our industry and the complete eradication of that um, opportunist, if you like. And I think that's because they have nowhere to go now uh, to, to actually uh, get cash for, for the small thefts that they undertake. Okay. Thank you. Does SIPA have concerns about uh, maybe increased dumping if cash payments are not made for, for small amounts? I think it's a, a legitimate concern. Um, there is potential for that at the small level uh, materials that aren't valuable. There certainly is potential for that. There's a system in place um, that we operate alongside local authorities called Fly Capture that monitors and tracks fly tipping, for example. So we should be able to monitor um, the, the effect or impact of this potentially um, through that system. Um, I wouldn't expect it to have a, a massive impact, though. I think the, the value of the materials we're talking about being stolen um, uh, is, is relatively high, and those, uh, those materials wouldn't be impacted by this. Uh, Mr McDougall, do you have anything that you wish to add? I would agree with Mr Walker, but it is a genuine concern. However, such as the extent of the balance needs to, be, needs to be struck, and I would submit that a cashless payment system is a vital tool in tackling metal theft. Thank you. Uh, one of the things which some of the scrap metal dealers raised when they were um, in front of the committee um, uh, was round about waste dealers, itinerant waste dealers who are licensed by SEPA, um, who uh, may be uh, left out uh, of this regime. Um, Mr Walker, would you like to, to comment on that? And do you think that these uh, waste dealers uh, should also have to be licensed for scrap metal dealing um, if, if, if that's what they're doing. And beyond that, if they're not, do you think that this legislation uh, may not stop uh, some of the things which are currently going on? OK. okay. Um, itinerant uh, metal dealers uh, in, in our, on our books would be um, dealers who don't operate from a, a site. Um, they perhaps operate from a, a vehicle, they transport waste. Um, on, a, on our books, they would be registered waste carriers, if indeed they have registered and are compliant with the legislation. We have many thousands of registered waste carriers, and it is not possible to identify whom within that, that portfolio of registered carriers who, who is an itinerant scrap metal dealer. So our, our own systems don't necessarily help to cover that area. Um, should they be licensed? Well, I think that, that's more of a matter for the experts on scrap metal dealing licensing. Um, I understand it's about 50-50 uh, that some scrap metal uh, dealers, 50% of them operate from sites, 50% are suspected to be um, itinerant. It makes sense as a regulator to try and capture um, the entire sector, from my perspective, um, but that's talking about environmental legislation, waste management licensing, that would be my approach. Um, so uh, I suspect that the itinerant um, scrap metal dealers should be covered by this legislation, but as I say, we're not experts in scrap metal dealer licensing. In terms of those folks who um, are licensed by yourself, in, in terms of uh, uh, the waste aspect of it, um, do you have any information at all um, about how many of those folks who are licensed by you would be dealing in scrap metal at any point in time? So we have somewhere in the region of 267 licensed premises who are specifically licensed to deal with scrap metal. That could be end-of-life vehicles, that could be precious metals or a combination of, of metal um, dealing. Um, we also have 69 uh, sites registered with us who are exempt from licensing. Um, it is not possible to tell... To be exempt? So there's a, they're exempt from licensing. They have to register with us. It's not, a, it's not an exclusion from the licensing system altogether. It's a lower tier within the licensing system um, that sets basic standards in the legislation rather than in licences. Um, they operate, for example, um, around the, the breaking of depolluted cars, so cars that have already been depolluted. Um, it's perceived that there's less of an environmental risk with that. Um, operators who depollute cars, deal with oils, would be within the upper tier of the licensing system and require a licence. So 69 are registered as exempt uh, with SEPA. 
it isn't, it isn't possible um, to, to tell how many of those would also be registered with the 32 local authorities as a scrap metal dealer. Okay. We don't have that information. <clears throat> um, I think that, you know, uh, the scrap metal uh, dealers who were here seemed to indicate that some of the itinerant folks were handling uh, quite large amounts of scrap metal. Do you have any evidence, Mr Walker, that that is the case? We don't have any evidence on that at all. Okay, thank you very much. Mr Wilson. Thank you, Convener. Just on that point, would uh, seek Mr Walker's view on whether or not SEPA would wish to operate a national registration scheme rather than what we have at the present moment, and you, you made the comment about the 32 local authorities, how many scrap dealers are licensed with uh, local authorities. Would it not be preferable that we, in the greater interest of everyone concerned, to have a national uh, licensing scheme which SEPA or some other national body oversaw and everybody was registered with that body? Mr Walker. Okay. I mean, there, there's a couple of different questions within that. Um, there's the issue around up dealing with the applications, which is perhaps different from the register itself. Um, and there's also the, 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 the difference between having a national register and perhaps having SEPA as one of the options um, to host that national register. Um, SEPA's view is that a national register could deliver benefits and improvements. Um, that's the kind of system that, that we operate. Um, it would allow better coordination of multi-agency efforts to tackle metal theft. It could uh, improve information sharing between the, the authorities and Police Scotland, British Transport Police. And it could also help address some of these concerns around the, the control and oversight of itinerant metal dealers. So on the issue of a national register and whether that would be beneficial, we think it could be. Um, however, any move to a national register would require a, a thorough evaluation of options, costs and benefits. Um, it would need to con be considered alongside the licensing process itself. Do you separate the licensing process out, retain that with the 32 local authorities and have a cent central national register? Um, would that national register necessarily have to be hosted by one body? Could it be a virtual nat national register that's operated by the 32 local authorities? There are a range of potential options there that would need to be explored. Um, SEPA at the moment isn't currently resourced to, to provide a national register of scrap metal dealers, but we recognise that delivering a, reg a national register through SEPA could be an option and we would be happy to explore that. Uh, Mr McDougall or Mr Jefferson, do you have a view on that at all? Mr Jefferson? Yes, um, I would support the national register. Certainly from, from our perspective, we deal with quite a lot of scrap and our contractors mainly deal with our scrap and to have the capability to put in the contracts that we have th this register exists and we expect our uh, contractors to work within that register and go to these accredited scrap or registered scrap dealers would be uh, of help to make sure that the, the, um, the scrap, scrap metal is able to be traced through its various cycles. So yes, we would, we would support it. I would also um, echo some of the comments uh, of Mr Walker. I know, again, because of our involvement in England and Wales, uh, there is a parliamentary group, in fact, in three weeks to discuss the implementation of the metal theft bill in the South. And the biggest, one biggest issue they have is around this, this very point, uh, uh, how you maintain that national register, both in terms of the responsibilities of the local authorities and, in this case, the Environment Agency's overseeing body. I know the registers, they're having problems actually getting the registers in place because the responsibilities are not absolutely clear and there is a number of discussions ongoing about the resources that are available to undertake this task. So I think this is pretty key and there's a good opportunity for Scotland here perhaps to take the lead in our... In our um, Mr McDougall, do you have a view? There is clearly a, a strong argument for such a national system especially since you appreciate that a itinerant metal dealer once granted a license and one authority can then trade over the uh, can trade uh, in Scot Scotland wide sorry can trade Scotland wide however civic government Scotland Act is very much uh, predicated upon a local 
on a local level, visibility for local authorities to attach local conditions. So I think any sort of move to a national licence system would require evaluation of all options, and it might well be a national register, might be an, an, another option. Mr Walker, you said that SEPA may not be in favour. Mr Jefferson gave a good example in, in what's happening in England and Wales because of the perceived conflicts at the present moment about who would be responsible for what. Uh, in relation to that, in terms of Mr McDougall's response, I know that SEPA work closely with local authority planning departments and environmental health departments. Could that same arrangement be applied with SEPA, but with SEPA having overall authority? Because I think Mr McDougall's comment about the itinerant scrap dealers where if they get licensed in Glasgow, they can effectively operate in Dumfries and Galloway. Uh, in those circumstances, would it not be better that we had SEPA as the overarching authority that actually uh, re had everyone registered under that body rather than the, what we have at the present moment? We have 32 local authorities uh, issue licenses to itinerant scrap dealers, uh, and we end up with a situation where depending on the authority uh, and the decisions of the authority, we could have people operating throughout Scotland, but there is no uh, apparent perceived control over what they're actually doing in different authorities throughout Scotland. Mr. Walker. Okay. I, I mean, I, I, we recognise the, the kind of benefits of local decision-making um, when it comes to local licensing um, considerations, so we, we kind of understand that and we can we can quite easily work alongside that and complement that. Um, as I, I said um, earlier, I think there are the, the actual licensing process itself is distinct from the, the, the national register or could be distinct from a national register. Um, it is entirely possible that the two could work in a complementary fashion if that was desired and if after an options appraisal it, it became evident that that was the right way forward. Um, as long as it was clear, picking up on the experiences, uh, experiences of our colleagues down south, as long as it was clear what the responsibilities were and that those responsibilities were effectively implemented by all involved, the 32 local authorities and SEPA, um, it is possible that itinerants um, could be registered either with a local authority, if you can get that system to work, or directly with a national body such as SEPA, who hosted the national register. Um, all of these are options which could could be considered, and there would be pros and cons um, for both. On the point about um, SEPA having the kind of ultimate authority um, over decision making, I don't think it's I don't think it's it's, a, it's not a good thing to have um, a decision making decision making locally, for example, um, a licensing board, and then to have some second some second bite at that with a national authority such as SEPA. So some distinct streamlining of the licensing decisions would need to be part of, of any system. You see, part of the problem that's been raised and the convener raised it in terms of the scrap metal dealers uh, and dealing with itinerant scrap metal dealers is the issue about uh, a local authority license the itinerant scrap metal dealer and as I gave an example of Dumfries and Galloway, that then allows them to operate in Orkney or Shetland. Uh, and it's who then has the authority to actually oversee what they're doing, how they're doing it, and what they're doing with the materials and how they're gathering the materials, essentially, uh, and that they're trading in. Uh, so, at the present moment, what are the circumstances, as you see it, that where an itinerant scrap metal dealer gets a licence in one authority, but then it's operating throughout Scotland? Who has ultimate uh, oversight of what that uh, dealers doing? As, as I've said, we're not experts in the scrap metal dealer licensing system. We have, have no role in that at the moment. Um, I, I am not sure how local authorities would handle um, an itinerant scrap metal dealer who um, didn't comply with the law or, or, or where another authority in a different part of the country had concerns. I'm not sure how that would work. Glasgow handle it. I think we'd be looking at uh, Police Scotland as an enforcement body to take action and uh, Obviously, Police Scotland would deal with unlicensed activity, but if it was a breach of a condition, we would be able to make a complaint and it would be brought before the committee. So it would probably be dealt with that way. If we were, because obviously, uh, Glasgow's local authority officers wouldn't have knowledge of what was happening 
in Orkney. So it would really come to Police Scotland. Perhaps that's one of the benefits of a joined up police force. And we would really be looking at them to, bring, to make the committee aware of it. So, Mr McDougall, you're effectively saying that Glasgow, if they issued an itinerant scrap metal dealer's licence, wouldn't always know what that dealer was doing in other parts of the country, and then we'd rel be relying on Police Scotland yes. to intervene, and to the, they would then report that to, to Glasgow, I'm, I'm assuming, uh, that then Glasgow would have to take action to remove the licence. I'm not aware of any specific examples, but I'm, I'm just, I'm just yes, hypothetically. Yes, hypothetically, hypothetically. Yes, that we could, the police would be able to bring a complaint to the, to the licensing committee of Glasgow, yes. It, it did, from my perspective, convener, it clearly highlights one of the issues that we have with the current licensing regime of particularly right itinerant scrap metal dealers, that it does become then become difficult the, and the oversight of what they're doing and how they're operating in particular other areas of Scotland. Uh, and it raises another issue about then the role of Police Scotland and the linkage between Police Scotland and other agencies and local authorities. Uh, could you, either Mr Walker or Mr McDougall, and that you, Mr McDougall, you indicated that you didn't have any examples where Police Scotland had reported incidents. Are SEPA aware of any incidents where itinerant scrap metal dealers are acting illegally or out with their licence agreement? Not aware of any circumstances. We might, we might have to convene a contact Police Scotland to seek clarification for Police Scotland. And uh, can, can I ask you, Mr Walker, beyond, uh, we've, we've used the, the terminology itinerant uh, scrap metal dealers, um, but itinerant waste dealers who may not be registered as scrap metal dealers because they fall out of the current regulation, have have any of them, uh, are you aware, been reported to Police Scotland for metal theft and metal dealing? Not aware of any cases in Scotland. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Uh, Willie Coffey, please. Thank you very much. Convener, I wonder if I could um, ask Mr Jefferson in particular about these the thousand incidents that you mentioned there. Uh, and to ask you really maybe the question another way around, how do you think this bill can ultimately reduce reduce that. So I'm, I'm interested in what happens in these incidents. Um, is the metal that are stolen, is it repurposed really quickly and disappearing uh, into the system? Is, is there an issue there? And how does the legislation help with that? Or is it really all about the registration scheme, the cashless nature of it? Is that what you expect would reduce these incidents? M maybe you could give us a couple of examples <coughs> of some of the incidents themselves and how they are getting through the system undetected. Yes, happy, happy to do that. Um, again, I, I, speaking from the experience that we've had in England and Wales, that I, my view is there are two types of, um, of thieves associated with metal theft. There's the organised uh, groups who uh, I believe are uh, hitting sites, uh, a variety of sites in a short period of time, um, and that could be our overhead lines, for example, that go across the countryside. We've seen a big upsurge in activity in that area so they may concentrate in the Falkirk area for for a couple of weeks uh, because we have you know 25,000 kilometers overhead lines it's very difficult to be proactive in terms of managing and um, uh, and securing that uh, asset base so they will hit a, an area over a week get quite a lot of scrap and I believe that they perhaps are taking that out through containers and taking that abroad so I don't think the legislation would necessarily uh, assist in that area. The other one is the smaller opportunist um, thief. And I think that's where we've seen a big effect from the scheme going in in England and Wales. And yes, you're right, it's the, they don't get ready cash for it. They, if they do go, then they have to present themselves with their identification. There may be CCTV on the site. And it's just a, a, a deterrent in general uh, to that. And as I've said before, we've seen a big reduction in that in England and Wales since the legislation came in. Now, I have evidence which I'm happy to provide uh, to the committee um, after this, this, uh, this sitting in terms of the, the reduction we saw in activity in England and Wales when the, the bill came in down south and it actually started to lift up in Scotland as some of these um, opportunists, I think, came north uh, to take account of the fact that we had a less stringent system in Scotland. 
So we do have, and that's not just for electricity infrastructure, uh, that evidence exists for other utilities as well. So, so material that's, that's stolen, is it, is it pretty much unidentifiable soon after it's been stolen? I mean, Yes, in general. Well, I mean, obviously we have um, specific types of cables and we've, we've got information that we provide to Police Scotland. So if they are on days of action, for example, which we do get involved in, in around scrap dealers in, in central Scotland, they're able to identify our cables, but they're not marked Scottish Power or, or um, with identifying um, mark. The reason for that, uh, well, one of it is cost, significantly cost significantly more to do that. And the reality is that we turn over perhaps 1% to 2% of our assets every year. So the amount of uh, benefit you would get from that, from a, a theft point of view, is fairly limited for that extra expense. So we tend to invest more in the proactive um, CCTV and, and guarding of high-risk sites and sites that are, are targeted quite a lot by, by thieves. But apart from that, you can the generic cables can be identified, but it's... They're not marked specifically with uh, Scottish Power, for example. Okay, and my last question on that, the, the issue about the 40 hours, what's the panel's view and whether that should be fixed? Should it be retained? Should it be flexible in terms of having to retain metal within premises for 48 hours? Should there be flexibility around it or should it be more stringent? If we start with you, Mr Jefferson, please. Again, it's probably a matter for Police Scotland rather than myself, but as long as the records are, that are kept are of, of sufficient detail, I, I don't think it's absolutely critical to have uh, the actual metal there for a, a prolonged period of time. But I guess Police Scotland are better, better equipped to answer that than myself. Mr Walker, please. Uh, along similar lines, I think Police Scotland's views are, are, are obviously foremost here. Um, we have noted the British Metal Recycling Association's concerns about tag and hold, and it raised some issues around um, potential uh, conflicts with waste management licensing conditions, our licensing system. Um, we are comfortable that the bill is drafted at the moment proposes to remove the tag, the tag and hold, so-called tag and hold provision. Um, if that was brought back in, um, then we'd just have to do a little bit more work with Police Scotland um, to ensure that there was an effective coordination and collaboration of efforts. Mr McNugo, please. As Mr Jefferson and Mr Walker have said, this is perhaps one where Police Scotland's comment would be useful. However, the Licensing Authority recognises that uh, this requirement may be, over, may, be, uh, uh, may be a burden upon metal dealers owing to the market in which you work in as a need to turn around metal quickly and also as Mr Walker alluded to, the requirements of SEPA licence. So I think uh, taking the new, uh, the new record keeping requirements, the license authority see this as being something that could uh, be done away with. So, so you think the record keeping uh, requirements uh, as, uh, as proposed in the bill are, are sufficient to, to deal with this matter? Do you think the record-keeping requirements yeah. as envisaged in the bill are sufficient to yes. deal with the difficulty? Yes, um, would you agree, Mr Walker? Yes. Uh, and Mr Jefferson? Yes. Thank you. Yes. Uh, Alec Rowley, please, yes. Particularly, I suppose, at SEPA, because the scrap metal dealers have argued that the larger ones would have to try and find more land, you know, that could be a much bigger operation. Would that not create more difficulties in terms of yourselves, in terms of trying to regulate that and compliance with, with, with the conditions that you would have to, to have, you know, this extra land? Okay. Yeah, there, there, yes, there would be a knock-on effect. Um, I, I have visited scrapyards myself and I know that space is constrained on many of the sites. For environmental protection reasons, we often impose conditions around quant maximum quantity limits, limits maximum storage, uh, limits the storage conditions. So, for example, some material has to be stored on impermeable concrete. So, tag and hold for the storage for 48 hour, hours could have an impact on the way that um, operators respond to our licensing conditions um, and may cause them some, some difficulties. Um, as I say, we would have to work with perhaps Police Scotland, but we'd also have to work with the individual operators to try and work through that. Um, can I ask, in, in terms of the current legal penalties uh, for failure to comply with the licensing regime, which is a, a maximum of uh, a £5,000 fine, do you think that uh, that needs to be increased? Uh, Mr McDougall? 
The, li uh, the licence for he does not have a specific view, uh, view on this matter. Okay, Mr. Walker. The the fine level is comparable with some environmental offences. If it would be helpful, I could provide some information on environmental offences and the fine levels, and that would allow you to to see whether there's parity there. That would be extremely useful for the committee. If that could be sent on to the clerks, uh, we'd be grateful. Mr Jefferson, do you have a, a view on, on the fine? Again, speaking from our experience, uh, um, I know that uh, the, the thieves that we have, uh, that Police Scotland and uh, the police authorities in, in England and Wales have apprehended on our sites. Uh, I, I don't believe that level of fine is really a sufficient deterrent or hasn't been a su sufficient deterrent for those individuals. Uh, so probably a higher fine or some other penalty would, I think, needs to be considered, uh, given, hopefully given the, the evidence um, I gave earlier with regard to the impact on communities and, you know, this is not a victimless crime. I think we need to make a, it would be beneficial to make a significant statement in terms of penalty. I'm not sure that £5,000 is a sufficient deterrent or it should be. Again, that's not my expertise area, but in my experience in, in England, Wales and Scotland, I don't believe that is sufficient deterrent. What are the value of some of these thefts? The, the Govan one, for example, um, that you gave earlier, what, yeah. what, what was the cost of that to, to Scottish Power and its customers? Uh, the cost of that individual event was somewhere in the region of three quarters of a million pounds. That's an extreme event. That's, that's the worst one that we've had over the last four years. But I guess the... On the other end of the scale, the, the, the Greenock example that I gave where we had smoke inhalation of a, a, an elderly member of the public and a number of small house fires, the value of the metal that was stolen to, to, um, that resulted in that incident was probably, for a scrap point of view, probably not more than £10. Can I go back to the Govan um, scenario? Yeah. Was the £750,000, was that the cost of the metal that was stolen or the cost of the entire event? It was the cost of the entire event. The cost of the entire event. And there was no metal stolen because... There the, was no metal stolen, but that yeah, cost £750,000. The, the fire was set, but it went out of control and the, the thieves had to abandon the scene without actually recovering any metal. OK, thank you very much. John Wilson. Do, do you mean it was just a, the same type of question to Mr Jefferson, because I think... You, in earlier evidence, gave the figure of a value of £4 million worth of uh, material stolen. Uh, it would be useful for the committee to understand, because that uh, £750,000 cost to put right the, the incident in Govan uh, clearly uh, gives a, a good indication of cost to Scottish Power to put right and uh, carry work to bring back into power. Uh, the line and the metal, well, in this case, they never stole the metal, but uh, the damage caused. But it would be useful in terms of the £4 million if you could provide us with a figure of some of the estimated costs that is actually uh, Scottish Power have to, had to bear to actually put right the scrap metal stolen, because you get the, the Greenock incident, you said the value would be about £10 in terms of metal, but the cost to Scottish Power would be substantially more than £10. Uh, so just to give us an indication of some of these costs and putting right uh, the thefts that have taken place uh, so that we can actually then compare that to the fines that are being imposed or potentially being imposed uh, for the, the criminals involved. In, uh, Mr Jefferson. Just to clarify, the, the £4 million pounds I mentioned um, are the direct cost of repairs, so that isn't the value of the actual metal. Uh, and then, again, I, I quoted approximately, you could double that for uh, revenue um, you know, uh, losses and other um, costs, if you like, associated with the actual events themselves and how we've had to manage them in terms of our response. In terms of the value of the actual metal, I, I, will, I will provide you with some information on that, but it's significantly less than four million in terms of the value of that metal that's been stolen. It would be useful for us to get a, an idea of how much the actual value of the metal was. But, you know, of great interest to us is that overall cost um, and uh, the inconvenience uh, to, to your customers. Um, I, I, I think, you know, um, the more that uh, it gets out there, uh, how much this is costing people. 
because it is your customers that are bearing the burden of uh, of of these costs because of these uh, these th thieves. So any information that you can provide, additional information, we'd be immensely grateful for, um, Mr. Jefferson. Okay. Okay. Uh, Stuart Stevenson, please. It, it was just to supplement that if there is anything available about the cost that are borne by your customers, there may not be. That would be very helpful. Um, uh, Mr McDougall, obviously you're involved in the licensing regime at this moment in time. Um, has Glasgow um, uh, City in recent times removed uh, licences um, from scrap metal dealers that you're aware of? Or how many refusals have there been in recent times for scrap metal dealing licences? Unfortunately, I, mean, I don't have those figures to hand. However, I could provide those if, if appropriate to your clerk. So it would also be extremely useful for us, I think, if we could have an indication uh, of how many applications that you've had as an authority for um, scrap metal dealing licences in, in recent times. Um, I, I think it just gives us an idea of, of the scale of, of what local authorities have to deal with. And obviously, being a, a larger uh, local authority, that gives us a, a, a good indication. Alec Rowley, please. So on the question, the I suppose it's enforcement. I'm assuming that, that in terms of a licensing authority like Glasgow or any, any of the 32 that are out there, that the majority of, of breaches of licensing will be picked up by, in the main, is it the police? Because I'm assuming you've not got enforcement officers that are constantly checking that. And could I pick also that same question that we see for in terms of um, scrap yards and, and whatever that are licensed Again, do you have enforcement officers that would regularly be carrying out checks, or are we very much reliant on Police Scotland uh, to ensure that, that people are, are sticking to what they say? Please. Yes, my view is that Police Scotland are responsible for the bulk of enforcement, and obviously there's other proposals in the bill uh, relating to civic licensing standard officers, which, if passed, that they may also have a role in relation to metal deals. If, uh, uh, I won't go on at length, but the bill process we have an information and guidance role, so that would, could be potentially of assistance, not just an enforcement role, but also getting in people who should have a licence, bringing them into the system, and also they're subject to scrutiny of the licence regime. Mr Walker, please. Um, so, so SIPA has waste management licences. Um, there's a, a licensing functionality, so going through the process of applying for licences and issuing licences. Um, beyond that, there is, a, there is an enforcement um, resource within SIPA. We have environment protection officers who routinely visit um, licensed and authorised sites to check compliance with licence conditions. Um, and we publish... We publish um, compliance scores, compliance assessment scores for all of our licensed and permitted premises on our website as well. Uh, thank you. Um, are there any other questions, committee? Just, just that question. Uh, Mr. In terms of the, the differences between the licensing regime in Scotland and the licensing regime in England and Wales, and, and I note that you did make comment about some opportune people coming up here uh, because the, the rules are different. What, what are the main differences? Mr Jefferson, I think you mentioned that. Do you know the main differences? <clears throat> In terms of what exists at the moment, yeah. um, the, well, the registration system is, is different. I don't think the identification of is required to the same extent as is proposed in the bill and is in place in uh, England and Wales. And obviously, cash can be transacted. So a lot of what's been put in the bill. There's not a huge amount of difference, I don't believe, in what's been proposed in Scotland and what exists in England and Wales. But I guess there are one or two things that are still being debated around the England and Wales legislation, which it would be obviously important for us to make sure is included in this bill in Scotland. The main one at the moment, as I've said before, is this um, the administration of the scheme, if you like, in terms of who takes responsibility for what. Getting absolute clarity as far as that's concerned. And I'm very much as I've said before, supporting that we have some sort of national accreditation system, because I think it also provides an incentive to the scrap dealers as well. If they're on it, then companies like Scottish Power are much more likely to use them for managing scrap, so there is an incentive for them to be accredited at a national level. 
And unless you've got some incentives in the system, then people are not necessarily going to comply. Mr Walker, have you got anything? Yeah? Nothing to add on no. that. Mr McDougall? Um, as Mr Jefferson remarked, the main difference in England and Wales is that we have a cashless payment system in operation already, and I also believe we don't have an exemption warrant system as well. So I think the, the introduction of those two uh, things in Scotland will be fundamental in sort of hope preventing regime shopping, essentially people coming from England and Wales to dispose of their scrap metal in Scotland. So yes. Thank you very much um, for your evidence today. Um, some of the information you've provided will be helpful in terms of uh, when we hear from Police Scotland on the uh, 28th of January in this particular issue. Um, uh, can I suspend the meeting uh, and move into private session, please? Thank you.